Sector after the meeting. Please also note that some members of the public may be exercising their legal right to record both the vision and sound of the meeting, which is entirely independent of the Council, and the Council has no control over the use of this recorded material. If you have any questions, please speak to the people who are making these recordings. Um, in terms of the agenda, um, we try to... Um, order the agenda in terms of the number of people that are coming to the meeting so that it, it means you're not staying longer than you have to. So this is the order of the agenda tonight. We're starting off with the um, 265 Burlington Road site. And then that's agenda item seven. And then 12, agenda item 12, which is 51 Princes Road. And then item six, Blenheim Road. Number 13, which is Rural Way. And then number 10, Flat 1, 29 Merton Hall. Uh, then 11, adjacent to 2 Ave Park Avenue. And then number 5, 177 to 187 Arthur Road. And then 8, 579 to 589 Kingston Road, items 8 and 9. As this is, uh, there's a lot of gender items on this um, uh, committee tonight, um, I would be very grateful to members if you will be concise with your questioning and with your comments so that we are able to um, deal with all the applications on the, on the agenda tonight. Um, we are going to begin, as I said, with agenda item seven, which is 265 Burlington Road, and so I'm, I'm passing to officers to introduce the report. Thank you, Chair. Can I first um, refer members to the modifications sheet? Uh, you'll see there's uh, some additional text that uh, has been um, added um, to uh, the, uh, the report which clarifies one or two um, issues, uh, provides safeguards in terms of um, requests for um, investigations into a CPZ um, in the area, and summarises a number of late letters and emails uh, raising uh, objections to the scheme, which have been received since uh, the report uh, has been published. Um, can I also bring members' attention uh, to the committee uh, agenda? You'll see at paragraph 7.615, the B&Q advert tower is um, uh, 37 uh, metres um, and not as specified um, in the report. Uh, can I also say that on the heads of agreement at the start of the report, uh, there's also a requirement that the applicant revisits the uses and design of the west-facing car park elevations in the event of land to the west being redeveloped. That's the actual site of the, um, uh, of the existing Tesco store. It was a request made by the GLA and the applicant's um, agent is aware of this and it's being factored into uh, any uh, discussions that are to be had uh, between uh, our uh, solicitors and those of the applicants. The uh, proposals um, concern part of um, the uh, existing Tesco store um, site um, between Beverly Way and Burlington Road and uh, a vacant office um, and warehouse um, building. Um, the um, proposals um, back onto um, some factory buildings on um, Burlington Road um, and you'll see um, here some shots um, of uh, the site looking into uh, the site from Burlington Road, again looking across uh, the car park. Here we can see the, um, uh, the vacant office um, building, again looking uh, across the car park towards where the development would be located, uh, again looking across the car park. And in the background, um, the redevelopment of uh, a site known as Albany House, uh, which is being built out um, at the moment as um, social housing. Uh, again, some further shots of the site showing the uh, industrial buildings to the south uh, of the site. Again, a close-up um, uh, of the site. We have numerous um, images um, showing uh, the proposals, um, which, as 
um, you may already be aware, uh, comprises um, what might be described as a, a high-density um, housing scheme on top of podium car parks and a number um, of uh, business units at uh, ground floor uh, level. Uh, the scheme has been the subject of some uh, amendment and that's introduced some modulation in terms of the story heights and also some articulation to the, the roofs uh, of uh, the buildings. And we can see here some images um, uh, which have been uh, prepared showing how the scheme might look and then internally um, as well. And again from the A3 and again some, some shots looking towards uh, the development. So looking into the site, um, providing uh, a pedestrian uh, route where you can currently um, enter for a short distance but not enter the car park, but you can leave uh, uh, the car park and that traffic arrangement would remain uh, the same. Uh, the ground floor includes a number of business uses and uh, residence meeting space and concierge um, uh, uh, office um, to provide access to uh, the flats. Uh, you'll see from uh, the proposals the scheme uh, would include uh, a substantial proportion, 40%, uh, which would be uh, affordable housing. Uh, some of the other key items to bear in mind, the car parking provision um, on the site would actually be no more than 20 more than currently uh, exists overall uh, on the site, which includes the vacant offices and warehouses. Um, you'll see as well the proposals include um, a walkway along um, uh, the Pill Brook. Um, this would be um, uh, very much for the use of residents at this stage, um, but in the event of uh, a proposal coming forward for the remainder of the site, um, that could provide uh, a more open uh, a walkway for um, uh, the public. The officer's report goes through numerous um, uh, detail, or in detail, uh, uh, across the uh, numerous um, planning um, issues, um, uh, including um, housing, loss of employment use, traffic, parking, biodiversity, uh, design, air quality, uh, and so forth. Um, in terms of uh, the planning assessment, I don't propose to, to um, take you through every last um, part of that report, but would like to um, just set out the way in which officers have approached this um, major scheme. The National Planning Plan Policy Framework sets out the basis for making decisions on proposals for development. Decision making is rooted in applying the policies in the development plan to the scheme under review. In the case of Merton, the development plan comprises both the local plan and the London plan. And while both are at different stages of review, in order to bring forward new plans, the revised London plan is more advanced with anticipated publication in spring this year. The Secretary of State's recent comments in the case of appealed applications for major developments indicates that he considers the policies in the draft London plan may be accorded moderate weight. When assessing proposals, some policies enable a quantitative assessment, whereas the application of others require a more subjective assessment. Added to this is the need for assessors to factor in the weight to be accorded to policies in draft plans. Both nationally and at a metropolitan level, there is an unquestionable drive towards delivering more housing, and the report reflects this. Similarly, at a national level, there is considerable weight being attached to quality of design and the need for planning to deliver successful design outcomes through placemaking. The weight to be given to the application of any particular policy in reaching a decision is not ranked. The scheme therefore presents planning officers with a variety of planning policy considerations, some quantifiable, others not, with any conclusions to be reached needing to factor in the status of the draft plans. The officer assessment therefore applies pragmatism in terms of the likely direction of travel of housing targets and the ability of the scheme to deliver affordable housing. At the same time, it offers views regarding other issues that are key to decision making, including the design of the scheme, traffic and parking. 
Finally, officers have considered legitimate measures that can be undertaken via planning agreements to mitigate certain of the impacts of the development and also help deliver affordable housing. And members are guided towards a suitable recommendation. Can I also say this in, in advance, really? Um, planning is controversial. People will um, have varying views of what's acceptable. Um, it would be really helpful if the people who are here tonight do not applaud when someone says something that you agree with. Um, if you could be restrained, that would be helpful, please. And I'm going to call upon um, Stephen Benjamin um, to speak first, please. The planning document clearly states that tall buildings are against Merton Council's core planning strategy, except in very specific circumstances that are definitely not met here. With reference to Shannon Corner, it says that they may only be appropriate where they will not have a detrimental impact on areas outside the designated industrial area. Rains Park High School can definitely not be classed as industrial. The proposed development is very tall. The 12-storey building nearest the school is 18 metres from the school grounds and 33 metres from the nearest classroom and will have an unfavourable impact that will bear down heavily on the school. After a long wait, it was only on Monday that we finally had sight of the developer's drawing of shadowing from the tall buildings, which clearly show that parts of the school's design building will be in shadow the majority of the time. Taking the 21st September and March equinox figures, at least some of the design building windows are in shadow from 12 noon until the rest of the school day. Variable natural light levels and darkness from the shadow of the building in the heart of the day will impact on the learning environment. The school's design block is the most sensitive for the school, as good lighting levels are essential for practical lessons in design technology and restricted daylight is strictly against the principles of DFE guidelines and empirical research. The DFE's daylight design guide clearly states good quality daylight within the learning environment is essential. Then the DFE advice on standards for school premises also states for lighting to be suitable, attention needs to be paid to giving priority to daylight in all teaching space. The DFE guidance is backed by published research evidence that students' progress is improved with the provision of optimum daylight in their classrooms compared to students who had less natural daylight. This development will therefore mean the school will be contravening guidance and good practice published by the DFE and backed up by empirical research. Its influence on teaching and learning will impact on pupil progress. We are sensitive to the council's need to provide more housing and especially affordable housing for residents. However, the 37 metre tall building is just too close to the school and the height raises serious concerns over safeguarding issues. The bar set for agreeing to tall buildings in the core planning strategy and the London plan is high. As the design review panel also pointed out, this development goes far from reaching this bar to the detriment of Rains Park High School, which has the responsibility to educate over a thousand pupils. Thank you. Philip Champion, please. Good evening, members of the committee. On behalf of AW Champion, I would like to add support to the many other locals who have very valid reasons for, the, for this proposal to be refused. AW Champion are timber merchants. We employ over 200 staff, and we have operated out of the New Morden branch at the A3 end of Burlington Road for many years. Our lorries deliver primarily to local builders and contractors who also collect equally substantial amounts of our products using their own vans and lorries. So good vehicle access to and from our premises is essential. Stationary traffic on Burlington Road means that our customers cannot enter and leave us, and this affects our business. Paragraph 7, 10, 13 of the committee report regarding the chip trip generation is correct in that it is not initially significant, but this is incidental to the main issue, which is the level crossing at West Barnes Lane. Your committee report acknowledges that level crossing at the end of Burlington Road as it changes to West Barnes Lane is a major source of congestion when closed. When the barriers are down, vehicles wishing to turn right across the level crossing need to wait in a short stacking lane that allows a filter lane for passing traffic. When this stacking lane is full, which happens quickly because it is so short, it obstructs the filter lane. This causes long queues to form on Burlington Road, and if the crossing is closed for any significant period of time, this backs up further to also gridlock the A3 junction at Shannon Corner and well beyond including Beverly Way. 
This blocks the entrance and exit to AW Champion, cycle lanes become obstructing, is obstructed, and what will be a main entrance and exit from the Red Road development also becomes <coughs> inaccessible. When Crossrail 2 is implemented, more trains will mean that the level crossing will be closed for additional periods, making the problem even worse. We have met with your officers to show them not only photos of the gridlocks, but also drawings to show how simply the stacking and filter lane problem could be resolved. Extending the stacking lane by adjusting the two islands that are very significant pinch points and gaining the total width needed for the filter lane and cycle lane can be achieved by using parts of the Red Road site frontage and the existing adopted highway. It is a realistic proposal that could be secured by a section 106 agreement that would also turn, in turn improve the efficient positioning of the new proposed pedestrian crossing and bridge, but it has not been incorporated. In conclusion, it is required, if it is required that a local authority should secure developments that will improve the economic, social and environmental condition of the area, which includes supporting local business and minimising traffic congestion, this development does not qualify and should therefore be refused. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Wingrove. Good evening. Um, firstly, I'd like to say I don't object to the principle of developing the Tesco sites, and I acknowledge there's an urgent need to provide housing. I do, however, have serious concerns over the design quality of this proposal, and I'd urge the Council not to be swayed into accepting this application purely on the grounds of necessity, and instead should insist on better quality. My greatest cause for objection is the use of the podium with undercroft parking. Sorry, can you hear me properly? Okay. Um, the problems include poor interface with the street, there being virtually no permeability, which will be even more detrimental if the rest of the site is developed in future. Offering places for concealment, no public access being permitted to the proposed play space, the gardens providing no visual amenity to the streets. And as a result of this, the development is significantly harmful to the public realm and functionally similar to being a gated community with those outside suffering. The problems associated with the podium were identified by the design review panel at PREAP and given red status. And the panel stated, the form and typology of the development was a long way from good practice, significantly out of date in terms of high quality, permeable and safe development. Um, and the panel suggested that one of the podiums could be at street level with parking underground. Um, and I'm aware the applicant rejected this on feasibility grounds and so no improvements have been made in the submitted scheme. But I'd urge the committee not to accept being told that doing something better isn't commercially viable, given the prominent landmark nature of the development. And much of the rest of the ground floor facade is also giving over to bin stores, plant rooms, water tanks and vehicle entrances. There are also numerous quality issues for residents of the proposed building. Many of the units are dual aspects in name only, failing on this important well-being requirement. Um, you know, through minimal side return glazed doors leading to balconies. And this appears to me to be a box ticking exercise rather than considered design. Similarly, the balconies, the balconies themselves, um, where stuck on, are, you know, close to useless. They'll almost likely never be used. They would be windy, feel unsafe, offer no privacy. And there are far better examples of how to incorporate outdoor amenity space through articulated facade design. The proposal includes only 12% three-bed family units, which is a shortfall of the 33% required in the London plan. And again, this was identified by the design review panel. And so in summary, I'd say for these reasons and many others identified by the 492 letters of objection, I'd urge the committee to reject this application. Design is a policy consideration. We should build houses on this site, but insist that proposals provide high quality public realm and high quality accommodation. We should insist on better. Uh, John Murch, please. Good, ev good evening, councillors. Can you hear me okay? My name is John Murch from Davies Murch, the planning agent for the application. Okay, sorry, I didn't want to shout. This scheme will provide 456 new homes with 40% affordable housing. This equates to 171 new affordable homes, 60% of which are for <coughs> affordable rent. Homes for rent will be genuinely affordable and secured in accordance with the Mayor's affordable rent benchmarks. Redrow proposes that the affordable rented homes will be suitable for families to help meet the growing numbers in temporary accommodation in Merton. If permission is granted, the Council could be providing homes to 94 families on its, on its waiting list before the end of 2021. 
We have been through the independent viability process, which concluded that the scheme could only provide 24% affordable housing. However, we support the borough's ambition to deliver affordable housing and the associated wider public benefit it will deliver. Redrow therefore proposes 40%. We understand the difficulty that members face in delivering affordable rented housing created by factors beyond your control, such as land values and the current economic climate. These factors have meant that the committee was only able to approve a total of 13 affordable rented homes from all developer applications in 2019. If the council intends to deliver affordable rented housing, the economic conditions dictate that this will only happen by optimising the development potential of land as per the proposed scheme. Ultimately, this will mean accepting a step change in respect of height, which we recognise has attracted public interest. Members will be aware that this step change is a direct response to the significant increase in the borough's housing targets set by the Mayor. The new London plan is very clear that connected brownfield sites such as this, such as this one, need to be optimised to ensure London delivers new homes to meet demand. This was confirmed by the Mayor within the Stage 1 response to the scheme, where he noted his strong strategic support for the proposal. This approach has also been supported by the Secretary of State in three recent call-in decisions this year. In each case, he attached significant weight to housing delivery that outweighed townscape concerns. In respect of the height, this must be considered in terms of its impact. The site is not constrained by immediate residential neighbours. Burlington Road and the railway line... Please. Burlington Road and the railway line se separate it from the suburban resi residential character to its east. The scheme performs very well in respect of daylight, overlooking and outlook, and will not impact the amenity of existing residents in planning terms. The conclusion of the townscape assessment is that the distribution of height across the site responds positively to the surrounding context. This view... Can I just please ask you not to interrupt, please? I know you may not be feeling happy about it, but please, please do not. Thank you, Chair. This view is shared by both GLA and Council officers. The scheme has changed significantly to respond to comments made by Council and GLA officers, the Council's design review panel and local stakeholders. The proposal is of very high qual quality. It is predominantly brick and takes references from the site's previous use as a printing press. The scheme's exemplary high quality architecture is also noted within the GLA Stage 1 report. My client has amended the height and design of the building following three meetings with Rains Park High School, which began in November 2018. Height has been redistributed, moving the tallest building away from the school. Detailed design measures will also be incorporated into the scheme to minimise overlooking. There are numerous examples across London for taller residential developments to be located next to or above school buildings. Furthermore, the buildings are at least 30 metres, 34 metres apart, and they perform very well in respect of daylight, sunlight and overshadowing. There would be no policy, planning policy basis to refuse the application. If permission is granted, my client will continue to meet with the school prior to construction starting to ensure impact is minimised in respect of vehicle routing, dust and noise. Turning to some of the other specific concerns raised by residents, we are aware of the traffic issues within the area, largely due to the level crossing. Both the Council's highway officers and TfL have considered the impacts of the development very carefully. It is their conclusion that the proposal would not result in severe highway impacts required by the... ..required by the MPPF to justify a refusal. It is also worth noting the existing site accommodates a similar level of parking to that proposed, which could be brought back into use without planning permission or through permitted development rights. In respect of infrastructure, the development will contribute circa £7.4 million in SIL and Section 106 payments to, to fund improvement and provision of local facilities. TfL have already identified that part of that funding will pay for upgrades to the public realm and increasing the number of local bus services. 
In summary, we understand that the proposals represent a step change of de in development in the area. My client has responded to this challenge with exemplary high-quality architecture that takes reference from the site's history as a printing press. The benefits of this scheme goes beyond its architecture. The scheme responds to local, regional and national planning policy shifts in addressing the acute housing shortage primarily for affordable homes, particularly for affordable homes. The Council should grasp this opportunity and take advantage of optimising the site's development potential as required by policy and endorsed in the recent appeal decisions. Detailed consideration has been given to all relevant planning policies and it has shown that this scheme performs very well. There will be no justifiable reason for refusal. We respectfully request that members follow the officer's recommendation and resolve to grant planning permission. Thank you very much. Um, do you want to respond? Um, can I call on um, uh, Councillor Stephen Crow, please? Thank you, Chair. The Tesco Tower site is on the boundary of Vanes Park and West Barnes, and I'm speaking on behalf of those concerned residents of Vanes Park and especially those with children at Vanes Park High School. May I start by offering two facts and two comments. One, the development comprised seven tower blocks up to 15 storeys high. There are no similar buildings for miles around. And two, we have received nearly 500 representations. Only three support the application. Regarding the details, the London plan requires tall buildings to be of the highest architectural quality and to not have a negative impact on the surrounding amenities. There have been numerous representations in respect of overlooking and overshadowing, the resultant demand for school places and medical services and the impact on traffic congestion. The application is for 220 parking spaces and 830 cycle spaces all within yards of West Barnes Level Crossing. Oh yes, there will be more congestion, of that we can be certain. It is of little wonder that both TfL and Network Rail have capacity concerns. I suggest it is also highly relevant that when the original application was examined by the Design Review Panel, they scored it red. The current application has barely changed and of course it is still 15 storeys high in places. So how would the design review panel score it now? We don't know but I'm sure we can guess. What we do know is that the density, the, sorry I'll say that again, the density matrix in the London plan specifies up to 450 habitable rooms per hectare for development of this type. This application is for 570 rooms. That's 27% more than the design matrix. This is on page 83 of your pack, committee members, and I, submit that, and I submit that this is unacceptable, even though the matrix is for guidance. It should also be noted that the mix of unit breaches our policy of having one bed, two bed, and three bed dwellings in equal numbers for large developments. Page 50 of the PAC refers. On behalf of residents, I urge you to reject this application due to non-compliance with CS14 and DMD2 regarding quality, siting, density and height, etc. And DMH2 regarding dwelling size mix. Thank you. Um, Councillor uh, Eloise Bailey. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm speaking as a West Barnes councillor on behalf of our residents, many of whom have made the effort to come here tonight. Um, they've written to us and the council to express their concerns about the potential negative impact of this development should it be passed. Um, there is a housing crisis. We need new homes. No one that I've spoken to has disputed that and has no one's been against development in principle. However, it doesn't mean that we should accept each and every application that comes our way. They must be right for the area, especially with large developments like this one, where the impact could be, hu could be huge. Um, so I'm here to speak against this. 
As stated in our representation, planning rules in Merton and nationally require that a development is in keeping with the local area and adds to the overall quality of an area. Um, how is it possible that 15 storeys of flats is in keeping with the rest of the structures in the ward? Almost all surrounding properties are two-storey houses with only very few exceptions. It's wholly inappropriate and residents have spoken eloquently about this tonight already. The huge strength of feeling about this proposal is evidence that it would not be positive for West Barnes. Look at how many people are here now. And although I can't actually see how many representations have been made since they've been removed from the website, I have to trust the report that tells me there were nearly 500. Um, and what's more, as people have already mentioned tonight, their plans, when they came to the design review panel in its early form, they were given a red rating. This surely means that there must be a dr drastic redesign for it to pass with a better grade. And from what we can see here tonight, that just hasn't happened. Um, what this tells us is that the experts agree with the residents in finding the proposed buildings are not in keeping with the local environment. And the plans in their current stage haven't even been to the panel, so why not? One positive thing I can say is that Red Row have listened. They have changed their plans. During the meetings we've had with them over the months, they have told us again and again that increasing the affordable element would make the scheme unviable, and yet here we are. They have relented and increased to reach the council's target of 40%, and if they can change this, what else can they change? Unfortunately, we don't feel they've listened enough. Very little has changed. The heights are simply reconfigured, and I ask that the committee please reject this application and ask Red Row to come back with a better plan that adds to the community, provides much needed amenities, and considers the residents who already spend their lives in the area. Um, there should be housing, but not at any cost. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hina Bukhari, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. I am also opposing the plans because there are not enough advantages for the local community and may even be damaging effects to the local area and its infrastructure unless more is promised by the developers. Hundreds of residents of West Barnes have objected because they know the reality of what this development will have in the local area and they should know. Today, Councillor Bailey and I are representing the views of the residents here and in West Barnes. Residents believe that West Barnes currently does not have the infrastructure to cope with the size of the development. We need step-free access to both Rains Park and Motsa Park train stations, increased bus services, a level crossing that doesn't cause traffic jams, that holds up drivers for over half an hour, safer pedestrian crossings and pavements, schools that provide the space for the influx of families, GP provision, and the list goes on. Residents are quite rightly worried by the environmental impact too. Trees, for example, in, st in the Tesco site and at Pilbrook will be destroyed. More could be done to save those trees. And replanting more trees is fine and, and good enough, but those trees will take a long time to grow again. We need to make sure that the trees that are being destroyed are, are put safely and planted somewhere locally. We have countless objections from residents about all these issues. Many have genuine concerns about the increase of traffic, which will mean more idling, which is currently not being enforced proper properly, probably because of lack of resources and funding. Rains Park Station is the top 5% of the busiest stations in the UK, with about 11,000 entries and exits every day. This must be a starting point for the improvements to the local infrastructure. Section 106 contribution should be focused on these concerns and it must be spent in West Barnes. There are not enough, uh, it's not enough to say that we are having a few more bus services or cycle access. When families who are moving into this area will have cars, relatives who visit will need parking and this in turn will put more pressure to car park zones being extended in the area and causing more strain for the local area. 220 car park spaces will not be enough for the 456 new homes. We need an extra medical centre or extra doctors to deal with the additional patients. Schools will need funding to add classes. And according to the government national planning policy framework, a sufficient choice of school places must meet the needs of the existing and new communities. The NPPF also states that the development must take into account of the long-term implications of flood risks. Local facilities are already struggling, and if you don't invest in West Barnes, it will not cope with the additional pressures. The residents of West Barnes are not NIMBYs. They are gravely concerned about the rash decision which is being going to affect the community negatively. We welcome new homes, 
but we must be sensible. Sorry, we I'm love gonna... this community and its vibrancy, and I'm we love this area, and we want people to live here in a sustainable way. Thank you. Would you mind? Chair, if I can just pick up on some of the points that have been raised. Um, uh, on tall buildings um, where um, it's been suggested that it's um, contrary to um, uh, the Council's um, strategy, um, if I can take you to um, page 89 um, of the committee agenda, which runs through to page um, 91, where officers um, look at um, the issues of massing um, and uh, height. And we've taken some time there to explain the approach to um, tall buildings and also set out um, the core strategy um, policy and indicated that um, it's not a, a, a blanket no to, uh, to tall um, buildings, but it's one where a degree of judgment needs to be um, exercised. Um, and again, I, I, as some um, uh, uh, as has been um, said at paragraph 7.6.21 uh, on page 91, um, while supplementary planning guidance can assist in guiding place making and help, and help inform and enable more precise judgments on matters of massing, um, in this particular instance, we've weighed up the policies on design and tall buildings and set this against the known and likely housing targets and reach the conclusion on balance um, that a tall building's approach to development in this instance could be supported. Um, there were some comments made about um, DFE guidance for new build, uh, sorry, for um, schools. Um, but again, if you look at paragraph 7.7.8 um, on uh, page 97 um, of um, the um, uh, officer's report. The guidance really relates to new build um, school buildings um, and it's not um, a, a similar approach to that taken when measuring um, the impact on natural light to residential um, buildings. Um, there's, um, there are concerns regarding um, density um, but again, you'll see that the London plan is being um, uh, modified so that uh, the approach to using the housing density matrix um, is going to be um, set uh, aside. And what uh, the plan is now saying um, is that um, uh, development proposals must make uh, the most efficient use of land and be developed at the optimum density. At paragraph 7.4.21, uh, where we look at the housing mix. Yes, the Council's um, planning policies um, have uh, an indicative um, borough level um, housing mix, but again, the emerging London plan um, says that boroughs should not set pres prescriptive dwelling size uh, mix uh, requirements. And after this, um, officers do um, make some observations as to how perhaps this might be approached. But you can see, uh, again, that we have um, our own plans, which were adopted in 2014, um, and we have to weigh those uh, against um, the emerging uh, plan, which, as I've said, um, officers anticipate um, will be adopted in spring this year. So there's, a, a again, uh, balance to be struck, weight to be attached uh, accordingly um, on these particular matters. Um, I acknowledge the concerns regarding um, the impact of the proposals um, on uh, facilities and infrastructure locally, um, but as the planning agent pointed out, there is a substantial contribution which will invariably flow from the community infrastructure levy contribution, which will um, uh, be required, so that's quite different from uh, the affordable housing contribution. That's set and it's based on square meterage. So again, a scheme of this scale um, will inevitably make a large um, SIL uh, contribution. Um, what I would say in terms of the way in which contributions are made, the um, regulations governing um, the way in which um, planning benefit um, money can be uh, spent uh, were, sorry, Regulations were introduced uh, a number of years ago um, so that there was a much um, stricter regime for um, 
uh, taking money from uh, developments to provide for infrastructure uh, improvements. Uh, we've had cases where planning inspectors have challenged um, officers uh, when looking to get little more than an upgrading of a footpath with some lighting next to a block of flats when the inspector asked at a public inquiry whether or not, whether or not that was directly related to the particular development. So I'm afraid in this instance, um, when we're looking at things like providing uh, improvements to stations which are some uh, distance from uh, the site, uh, I'm afraid I think that would be very much stretching the point in terms of being legitimate and lawful in terms of the application of those, those regulations. I'm open for questions now. Councillor Lanning. Thank you, Chair. Just on the 40% affordable housing, um, the GLA stage one response, I think, suggests that the 60% the London affordable rent element would be affordable for households earning £90,000 and under. Is that the case, or will the site be genuinely affordable and support those in temporary accommodation, as the applicant suggested? Chair, um, if we've got um, feedback from uh, the GLA and the benchmarks that they're applying um, are set out um, in their um, guidance, then I think it would be um, improper for the Council to seek to impose its own um, different standards um, on uh, something uh, like this. Um, the delivery of 40% um, affordable housing um, is considerably beyond that that we would regularly get on a, a lot of housing schemes. Um, and really, I, I think beginning to drill down to that level where we're sort of setting thresholds for, for, for what people can earn, provided it meets with any guidance issued by the mayor, then I, I think we really need to stick with that. Councillor Dean. I think the road outside uh, this plot is called West Barnes Lane. What's the current width of West Barnes Lane uh, as you turn left out of the plot towards the crossing? And what are the current width of the pavements? And what will the width of the road be and the width of the pavements? Chair, sorry, I, I, we need to refer to the drawings. Whilst that's happening, once to speed things along, carry on. Uh, before the meeting, or mm, we uh, did right, in my okay. email. <laughs> oh, I haven't seen an email from you. Did you send that today? Okay. All right. Um, so the other, the second question was in terms of the um, the level crossing and how many minutes per hour is that closed for currently. Yes, sorry, that, that, that in, in terms of the, the length of time it would be closed. In terms of the length of time it would be closed, that would depend on the frequency of trains, depending on whether it's peak or off peak um, uh, in any event. In excess of 20 yeah, the reason uh, I didn't ask questions before is that I, I just thought this is a very important subject, which. Um, on the basis, I imagine the council has spoken to the landowners and the transport authorities. These were the kind of questions that would be specifically asked, because as you turn onto West Barnes Lane, it's, it's clear that there isn't any space for two car, uh, two lorries to go down when the level crossing is, is down. So I just thought this was an important um, piece of information which the the officers would have uh, on hand. I'm sorry, but I am. Chair, um, in terms uh, of uh, vehicle movements, the traffic modelling uh, produced by the applicant um, has been examined by the council's transport officers and also um, Transport for London, because remember, we've got a site which has both, both uh, frontage onto Burlington Road and also onto Beverly Way, which is part of the Red, Red Route um, network. And no overriding concerns have been raised in terms of... Yeah, 
Sorry, I am going to stop the meeting. Um, if this carries on, we, we will stop the meeting. There are eight other applications here waiting to be heard. Please do not interrupt. Let us make a decision. Well, can we have the debate? Thank you. The traffic modelling, which has been undertaken by transport, uh, sorry, by the, the applicants' uh, agents, have been scrutinised by Transport for London and the council's own transport officers, and the proposals um, are considered to have some impact locally. And you'll see on the uh, report that there are requirements for um, uh, improvements um, at um, a nearby junction. Um, and uh, you'll also see from uh, the report that there are requirements in terms um, of uh, pedestrian improvements locally. Finally, you'll see from the report that there are issues regarding the way in which uh, the um, level crossing could be substituted by uh, a different uh, arrangement to free up uh, the flow of traffic. But for the time being, that's very much linked to any decision being made um, on the um, Crossrail 2 uh, proposals. And therefore, at this very moment, it would be unreasonable to factor those in to any assessment. Councillor Dean. One last question on that. So uh, mm -hmm. all councillors uh, here and officers will be aware of Crossrail 2's engineers that have visited the site many times. And many of us have been with them personally. And um, they have made uh, uh, various points to um, Transport for London, to the Mayor of London and to London uh, Borough of Merton. Um, so what is Crosstrail 2's opinion on this particular application? It's in the report. In the report, but one of the reasons I want the, everyone to hear is I want to hear uh, opinions of the council because quite often the opinions are different from the writing and there's a lot of people here that are interested so rather than get them shouting it'd be much better if we heard the evidence chair uh, chair i do get frustrated Sorry. that another council keeps criticizing this like if he can just go through the chair i'd be much happier rather than keep so if i can take members to page 69 um, of uh, the committee agenda, um, and you'll see there uh, there's um, uh, a detailed uh, response from Transport for London, and the first three paragraphs uh, relate to um, Crossrail 2. Um, and you'll see um, uh, it says, whilst the application site is outside the limits of safeguarding as set out in the 2015 Crossrail 2 safeguarding directions, part of the application site has been identified as a proposed work site. What officers would um, note um, is that um, there's been um, no um, formal um, uh, safeguarding um, of this um, uh, uh, site that would preclude a decision from being made um, on this particular um, proposal. Um, as I said, the, um, uh, the, the discussions regarding um, uh, the delivery or otherwise of Crossrail 2 has yet to be resolved. Um, and so in that respect, it's important to make a decision on the basis of what is known rather than what is being speculated upon. Councillor Henry. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to find out, um, uh, in, term of the, in terms of the 40% um, um, affordable uh, flats, on what floor would they be located, please? Thank you, Chair. I, I will come back on, on that. The affordable housing units are to be found in cores A and B. It's all of core A and the majority of core B. Some of the upper floor units in core B wouldn't be affordable units. Um, and we can show those on the plan. I hope you just bear with us. So the, 
that's core A, where you can see the hand at the moment. The entirety of that would be affordable housing. Core B, which is just to the south and part of, of that same uh, structure, um, the majority of units in that would be affordable housing, apart from a few on the top upper floors. Thank you, Chair. Can I ask a question about single aspect, please? How many of the um, flats will be single aspect? Thank you, Chair. Um, I direct members to page 98 and paragraph 7.8.5 onwards, uh, titled Dual Aspect Rating. You can see on the, the next page, page 99, at 7.8.8, .8, we have a breakdown of the percentages of through units, i.e. a window at either end, which is 11%. Corner units with windows on two sides, that's... 54%, and units with what's called an enhanced window return, so windows to two sides but not a, not a corner unit, uh, 33%. Single aspect um, units um, east facing at 2%. Thank you, Chair. The single aspect, when we say 2%, that's 2% of 400 and nine. just nine, nine flats in the, whole, in the whole development. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just a very quick question. On page 47, uh, it says that part of the proposal is 103 square metres of office meeting space. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Page 47, uh, under the proposals, it says 103 square metres of office meeting space dedicated for use by residents only. Could you clarify what that is, please? Yes, so we've got a, a, a large um, uh, housing development. And uh, if we were to uh, look at um, perhaps something more conventional, um, streets of two and three storey houses, you might reasonably expect there to be a community room to serve uh, the residents on a housing estate. Uh, we're looking at 450 dwellings. Um, so there's an opportunity with this um, particular uh, development uh, to provide um, a, a small, uh, sp sorry, not a small space, a space of 103 square metres. Um, which can be um, used by um, residents. Um, if you have um, a sig significant social housing element, you might reasonably expect a tenants and uh, or tenants group uh, to be formed. With the remaining um, number of uh, dwellings, again, you know we're, we're looking at um, uh, perhaps um, uh, between 250 and 300 units. You might reasonably expect a tenants group. Uh, to be formed. So there's an opportunity with a, within uh, a development like this to provide uh, a space and where the hand is circling on the screen that's the space that's been um, identified. And then we have um, over here the office, the concierge for the, um, uh, for the development as well. I've got, I've got two questions, please. The first one is on page 85, which is the housing mix. And the housing mix is clearly very different that's proposed than, than our, um, you know, our recommended housing mix. And I understand from what the officers were saying that the emerging London plan can overrule that or be taken into account. But that says when it's informed by the local housing need. And what I'm not clear is what information we've got that the local housing need has such a much bigger um, demand, I think it's 63% for two bedroom and only 12% um, for three bedroom that is proposed. So I was just wondering where the evidence is that, that, that what's proposed reflects the local housing need. And the second question is on page 90 which is when it's talking about tall, Merton's tall buildings background paper, 
It says that tall buildings are generally not appropriate within the borough due to its predominantly suburban low-rise character. Um, and I'm not quite clear why this bit of the borough, which seems to me to be pretty suburban, I know this, you know, this, it's a car park and a shopping thing, but it's obviously surrounded by suburban areas, why this isn't felt to be suburban and therefore appropriate for tall buildings. Thank you. Chair, um, if I can um, take members to page um, 86 of the officer's um, uh, report, um, you can see that we haven't shied away from uh, something which looks as if it's in conflict with our uh, plan. We said the proposals would appear to set up a tension between adopted local plan policy and emerging, emerging strategic plan policy. Um, but in terms um, of um, housing needs, the applicant has liaised with um, Merton's housing officer. And in terms uh, of um, known housing needs relating to affordable housing, they've pitched that element uh, of the scheme in a way, or they've, they've created a mix which they believe responds to known and quantifiable needs from Merton's own housing um, officer. With regards to the other element um, of the scheme, that's market driven. So if it's market driven, it's a case of, is it a case of demand from the market or is it need from the requirement to provide good quality social housing? Well, I, I'd suggest there's a bit of a distinction that can be drawn there. And so provided that the scheme focuses on meeting known needs for affordable housing, then realistically, it's not completely out of sync with um, our policy and the emerging London plan policy to apply a degree of flexibility to the market housing element. In terms of the point that you raised regarding um, Merton's um, tall buildings um, background uh, paper, um, you'll see that a couple of the factors that um, have been raised there in terms of going for tall buildings um, it, 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 it identifies where regeneration or change is envisaged. Well, in the council's draft local plan, um, this parcel of land and the neighbouring um, uh, uh, retail store are identified as a proposal site suitable for regeneration to provide um, housing and a reconfigured store. There's also the point about it having good public transport accessibility. Well, again, it, it, it's rather sort of chicken and egg, egg here that although it may not seem to have the best public transport accessibility, the proposals through Section 106 agreements and contributions will help improve bus frequency to the site. So, again, it's, 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 it's very much sort of a travelling um, uh, set of um, uh, considerations um, here. Uh, matters aren't entirely static. Um, and as I've said in the, in the report, a higher density tall building scheme could be considered to meet with the council's planning policies. Councillor Russell, making. Thank you. I've got a number of questions, the, basically on the checklist information at the beginning. Um, ask them all at once and you can answer them afterwards. Um, first one, why is no environmental statement required? The second one is, if there's a contribution of 24000 for place space, that implies to me that there isn't any place space on the site and it's to go somewhere else. Uh, the third question is, carbon short shortfall contribution of 651000 does that mean that this is not carbon zero, which is against the climate emergency that we passed as councillors in September uh, for zero carbon by 2030? Um, and also the same thing with financial contribution towards air quality. Um, chair. Um, uh I'd explained um, uh, before that um, uh, planning officers are bound by um, uh, regulations regarding uh, where we can secure uh, financial contributions to mitigate against the impact uh, deriving from a particular um, planning proposal. Um, just looking at the contribution towards um, air quality um, uh, impact, uh, the proposals um, uh, 
will no doubt have an impact in the short term in terms of construction. And so there may be uh, requirements for the Council's Environmental Health Service to uh, monitor that and to take action um, if, uh, uh, if needs be. In terms of the uh, carbon shortfall uh, contribution, it has proved to be particularly challenging for um, house builders to meet uh, the exacting standards of achieving zero carbon um, footprints for um, new dwellings. And to that end, um, there is a mechanism whereby the carbon shortfall can be um, calculated. Uh, and it doesn't mean that the scheme um, doesn't have uh, good environmental uh, credentials. Um, it's simply um, that um, this is a means by which the council can capture any shortfall between the equivalent of what used to be code level four for sustainable homes and zero carbon. So it's it, it's really a, a case of um, uh, looking at um, the uh, construction uh, credentials of uh, the scheme and making sure that as a council we can capture any um, shortfall um, there. On play space, there is in fact play space, um, but play space um, is um, uh, looked at in terms of providing space for um, uh, toddlers, smaller children and older children. In this particular scheme, um, the scheme meets uh, requirements up to uh, a particular uh, age, but beyond that, because it is quite a high density um, uh, urban uh, format, it hasn't got the conventional um, play space that you might associate with um, perhaps teenagers, the kind of play space you might associate with uh, you know, suburban um, housing developments from, from maybe the 50s and, and 60s. So again, what officers have sought to ensure is that uh, a play space contribution uh, is made which would then be um, placed in uh, an account with uh, a sufficiently long time frame to ensure that if any proposals did come forward where that actually provided for improvements to um, play facilities for older um, uh, children that that could be directed towards those improvements. Councillor McKim. First of all, on the carbon shortfall, there are other councils that manage it, so why can't we do it? Like Aitita, Nottingham, etc. Um, the environmental state, I know the environmental statement was not required according to the GLA, etc., and the publication here, but I feel it would have been a useful document to see. Um, and the third thing is, which I didn't raise before, is if the design review panel were consulted on this application as it stands now, do you think it would have been different than a red? Can't, can't comment on that. Sorry, it's up for the design and review panel to make comments on that. Southgate. Thank you, Chair. Um, I may have missed it, but what? Uh, how will these homes be heated? What? What form of fuel? Chair, for uh, a scheme um, such as this, the details would be embedded in the um, uh, energy statement. You'll see that there is an energy centre located here within uh, the development. Um, but I acknowledge that um, depending on the time frame for construction, um, any developer is going to have to factor in uh, the drive towards um, reduced reliance um, on um, gas as a means of heating and increased reliance um, on um, electricity. Um, but if, as a result of the detailed specification um, of the scheme changing uh, at any stage, then I'm sure our climate change officers uh, would want to scrutinise that and adjust any carbon shortfall contributions accordingly. I'd like to take, yeah. Um, please, will you be kind enough to show us again on your plan where are the re uh, refuge collection um, storage areas are?
Chair, um, looking at uh, the, uh, the plans, we've got uh, a refuse area there. We've got um, refuse there and another refuse area there a smaller one here one towards the front there and then for the southern uh, block we've got a refuse area where the hands moving here one on the corner there and one at the back over here. I want to move to comments, please. Councillor Dean. Uh, uh, lots has been said, but um, there are a number of issues with this particular uh, application. Um, uh, the PTAL is only two or three, depending on which part you're at. Uh, and uh, whilst I hear um, what the emerging plan may say, uh, the fact is that we've always looked at dense buildings when the PTAL is five or six. You can't really get much lower than, than two or three, so that uh, gives a problem. I think the, the Crossrail issue is that Crossrail won't be able to come to New Morden um, if it can't engineer itself there. And uh, many councillors in this room and, and some officers have been with Crossrail down to this specific site and knowing that they need a lot more space. And this space will disappear forever. This won't come back. Um, there's no doubt that uh, the road is a nightmare. Uh, to get London buses uh, through where the f uh, crossing is, it's incredibly narrow. And I accept uh, accident statistics will um, uh, say there isn't an issue, but there really is an issue. And uh, one of the objectors mentioned that you can't get out the Tesco site and turn left if the level crossing is down. So this is going to be exacerbated significantly by this. And, and actually, uh, as a planning authority, the planning authority should say that the road needs to be three or four metres wider and the pavement be wider before we do anything here, because clearly we are causing ourselves our own problems. Uh, the officers have said twice today that they see the whole site as a development site. So this isn't about 450 homes. This is about triple the number of homes. And if you do that, there is no amenity space here. Um, I know exactly what the developer will say. Well, you gave it to me last time. So why on earth do I need to think about green space? Why on earth do I need to think about amenities for the other 1,000 uh, apartments that will go on here? So we're not just looking at 400 flats. We're looking at 1,000 to 1,500 flats. And we should think far more broadly. Merton says this is a great place to live. Well, this won't be a great place to live when there is no streets here. There's no life on the ground floor at all. There's no life at all. This will be a ghost town on the ground floor. And you're going to have um, 1,000 people living in a ghost town and then another 2,000 people living in a ghost town. And that's 3,000 people not living in a great place, not having Crossrail 2, which is exactly what the Mayor of London and the national government want to provide because this will stop it to New Morden. And in terms of um, design review panel, they said red, and they've said that 35% of these flats are single aspect. And um, I don't accept what the uh, developer has said in terms of it being far lower. So we have hundreds of children, according to this document, will be living here, no schools. Um, uh, Crossroad 2 will be stymied. Um, 450 flats is not a great place to live. We should have the mix that there's 60 councillors here pro propose, which is 35%, three beds and above. Now, um, I'm told all the time, and it's only qualitative, but I have to say I feel quite emotional when I hear about the housing list because all I hear about is families that don't have homes. I don't hear about single people. It's always about the families. There's nothing here for families. There's nothing here at all. And these... Private flats will be up for sale for 300,000, perhaps more. That's not going to get anybody off the streets. This isn't going to get any family off a housing uh, list. So what we really want to see, if this area is going to be developed, some low-rise, some three-bed apartments, some houses, some space, some amenity space, so people can live how they want to. 
And I think every single councillor um, would want something here that works for the people. We need a wider road as well. All of these reasons say that we have to reject it for the reasons the objectors and the councillors have proposed tonight, and that's what I propose. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this application got a red at the last design review panel. Now, in my experience, when an application gets a red, the applicant usually goes back to try and get a green. So my concerns are that the applicant didn't go back to the design review panel. He submitted some, a new application, which doesn't really answer the concerns of the review panel. So in my opinion, it still has no rationale with the heights of the buildings. It's still poor quality design. It still has access problems and traffic problems. And really, I would be looking to refuse this for bulk mass height, which is DMD2, uh, and traffic and parking, which is DMT2. Thank you, Chair. Um, it is undeniable that there's a housing crisis across London and certainly in Merton. Uh, targets for building new housing are about to increase significantly. Um, if, as been stated, on this site you wanted to build some, you know, very nice three, four-storey low-rise houses and masonettes, it just would not be financially viable. The only reason we're getting 40% affordable housing out of the site is because of its size, because we are, uh, because the proposals are to put more than 400, more than 450 dwellings on this site. Um, we would not get anywhere close to the affordable housing that this borough particularly needs if the buildings weren't as big as this. Um, there are, and have been expressed tonight by many people, some concerns, some significant concerns, and my view as people who have sat on this committee with me for many times, uh, for, uh, over many meetings, is that we will never get a perfect um, planning application in front of us which ticks every single box, which does everything right, which has no problems with it at all, and that is why we have a committee to balance the pros and cons. Um, the pros of this is 450 new housing, 40% of which social housing. Uh, from my point of view, to deliver that for the borough outweighs the cons of this application, and I think we should reject um, the motions in front of us uh, that suggest we reject this application, and I think we should pass this and get it built and deliver the housing for the people of Merton. Chair, thank you. Um, yeah, when I settled down with this long uh, report, the, the first thing that hit me really was, was rather like Councillor Latif, the, the comments of the, the design review panel, and in particular their comment about a lack of uh, any rationale for the, the proposed story height. So, so it's as if this is a scheme that has not really uh, been properly thought through within the the proposed context. They commented more appropriate perhaps to Vauxhall and Nine, or Nine Elms. It does strike me that it's also out of keeping with the emerging London plan that developments at this density and intensity should be very much around transport hubs. So I'm sure it will happen if something like this were to come forward for development in, in Morden. Um, we would be looking to, to grant that and we would make it uh, car free and, and so on. Um, but this one is, is a bit stranded on, on, on this site to, um, to, to go to that, that, those kind of densities. I'd make the point, too, that we are sort of stretching all of our policies, are we not, on it's uh, outside the matrix of densities. OK, we're told we can't take that as binding. The mix is not within the, uh, the, uh, our preferred or what our own housing needs survey tells us. I, I don't quite think that that should be separated between 
social housing and market forces. I thought it applied to all the housing we built, actually, that we were aiming at that um, roughly one-third, one-third, one-third uh, distribution. So it's, we're invited to make a step change. Um, I feel rather more we're stepping in, taking a step into the unknown here. And without um, a further appraisal by the design review panel, I, I'm really not happy to support it at this stage. Thank you very much. I just wanted to, I mean, I think some of uh, my colleagues have, have said the, uh, very good points. I think the trouble is that with this proposal is there's a whole series of things that we're having to, as, as Councillor Southgate said, we're having to stretch. We're having to stretch the density. We're having to stretch enormously the, um, the uh, percentage of different size, bed, of different numbers of bedrooms. You know, we have a, we have a, a plan which says 35%, three plus, and we've got 12. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't say local affordable housing need, it says local housing need, so I think we're absolutely not right there. We say we don't like tall buildings, and yet this is a tall building, and the DRP thing, I think it's very significant, they haven't gone back to the DRP for another review, so um, I, I agree with the other comments, I think that all of those add up to something that I don't think I can vote for. You've moved a recommendation. Can you repeat it for us, please? Uh, yes. Uh, we refuse it under bulk, mass and height, which is DMD2, uh, and then traffic, access and parking, DMT2. Are there anything else that you want to add to that, Councillor Southgate? I'm just looking at you because of the one... I did. Yes, the trouble is I can't... Put my finger on the right policy right now, but it, it is about context. It is about whether something on Las Vegas proportions is appropriate for the former car park of, of Tesco's right here. Sorry? Yes, can I get a seconder, please? Councillor McGrath, thank you. Okay, then I'm going to. Um, we have to be very clear on the reasons that this is being um, recommended for a refusal. You are happy with your recommendation? Okay, can I see those in favour of the recommendation, please? To, to yeah, to um, refuse on those grounds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those against, not voting. The recommendation is, is agreed and the application is refused. So the next agenda then is 51 Prince's Road, which you're very happy. Yeah, number 12, and we're off. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members, a site outlined here in red is on the junction with Princess Road and Trinity Road. Uh, the site currently comprises a um, former doctor's surgery. It's currently vacant at the moment. Uh, existing block plan. Um, so site largely covers a lot of the site with the built form. At the back there is a right of way of this access at the back at the rear of the property here. Existing elevations. So it is an end terrace building here um, with some flat roof extension single story out the back of it at the moment. Uh, existing floor plans, um, two vehicle um, drop curbs at the moment on the site um, and as laid out here on the existing plans as a doctor's surgery. Proposal itself um, is to extend the property um, and change of use to create five two-bedroom flats. Um, you will note within the report that the application, the site has a fairly lengthy planning history um, with a recent uh, 2019 application uh, that was refused. So in terms of the proposal itself, it is one less flat than the refuse scheme, so it's five flats proposed now, um, all two bedroom, so two on ground floor here with outdoor space at the back here, two at first floor and one within, within the um, top floor. The design of the proposed extensions is largely to be a traditional approach um, to reflect the surrounding character of the area. So at the front, extending across, uh, slate pitch roof, 
On the back, we have a mansard roof and a traditional two-story rear extension here. Turning to some of the um, landscaping here. So at the front, uh, this is to be grass, along with grass, amenity spaces at the back. Four car parking spaces are proposed and a cycle store at the front here adjacent to the main entrance. Referring to the previous scheme, so this is the previous scheme that was refused under delegated powers. Um, this is here for reference if members wish to look at it. In comparison, it was much more of a contemporary approach with a higher ridge line, flat roof addition and deeper extension at the back. To site pictures, uh, existing front here on Princess Road. So proposal extensions out here. Uh, view from the corner. Uh, view from Trinity Road. So all the flat roof extensions and additions would be removed. Um, of note that the um, hard standing at the front here, a lot of this would become um, grass. Um, on site itself, so the property at the back, site on the right hand side, so the nearest neighbouring property is here. And a view further back, just on Trinity Road, which is in the property here. Some members will note the, the design large in the surrounding area, Victorian villas. And a view from the side. So the drop curb would actually be extended, new boundary wall reinstated in here with soft landscaping behind. And just a view further down Trinity Road, site on the right hand side. So members overall, um, officers consider the proposal has overcome the previous objections to it and recommend approval. Thank you. Um, call on Stephen Tyler. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, Myself and other local residents consider this to be um, an overdevelopment of the site. Um, it is, in fact, a dense development and an over-dominant development on a small site in an area, as the officer has said, which is predominantly um, single Victorian houses. Um, I also question whether the, um, the development of five two-bedroom flats can adequately, adequately support the number of residents references made to potentially 17 residents living there. I appreciate that that is unlikely, but um, five two-bedroom flats um, would significantly uh, increase the number of residents on that site. Um, parking and highway safety are important considerations. Uh, control parking zone W3 is already oversubscribed in the area, and to use the four proposed sites, um, parking bays uh, of the development, it would be necessary to reverse in or reverse out of the site, um, impacting significantly on a busy road, which is already uh, suffers congestion at peak times and a significant impact on safety. Um, a point easily missed is in fact the proposed building line on Trinity Road which extends significantly further than the existing houses. You can see on the plan, number 18, 16 and 14, going towards the Broadway, um, the extension to the front of the proposed development significantly extends beyond the current building line. I believe, uh, and my fellow neighbours believe, that it sets a dangerous precedent, particularly with regard to the development of corner sites. Uh, it will impact on the appearance of the neighbourhood, and particularly having um, reference to the South Park Gardens uh, conservation area. Uh, briefly, I also want to uh, draw your attention to the written, uh, comprehensive, detailed written representation by Bernadette Valen, who lives at number 49, who owns number 49, and the severe impact that this development will have on her property. Uh, she makes reference in her representation submitted to the planning department on the 14th of January about overshadowing and loss of light, 
um, particularly with reference to the two-storey pitch roof rear extension and the one-storey roof projection. There is also overlooking and loss of, loss of privacy with windows overlooking her garden and rooms within the house. And it also will have a significant impact on the front bedroom, ground floor bedroom, where one of the parking bays, a proposed parking bays, will be within one metre of the bedroom window. She also makes reference to... I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to stop you there because you've had three minutes. OK. Um, is Olamide Adenugba here? No. Not present. Lisa? No. Not present. OK. Um, can I call on uh, Nigel Husband, please? You have three minutes. Where's Nigel Husband? Is he not here? Sorry. We're in a minute. We'll start the clock when you have your mic. know what's going on here. It's my switch off. Come on. No, it's still coming on. It's a nuisance, isn't it? None of them will come on while my's no, on. Nothing that? Yeah. Abstain? No. no. This has done it before. It's on. It's on. Yay. Right. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Sharma, the applicant, has been a partner of the Princess Road Doctor's Surgery for the past 40 years and has dedicated herself to serving the local community. She had hoped that her legacy would be that the Princess Road surgery would be refurbished and improved and brought up to modern standards. And it's to that end that the planning application for an extension and refurbishment was granted and technically work started in 2010 and is still current. The approved scheme involved a significant redevelopment of the site, including a three-storey tower at the corner of Princes and Trinity Roads. However, subsequently, the lo local NHS Trust made a strategic decision to build a new, larger surgery, and we located at Patrick Dooley Clinic, some short distance away, which has absorbed the Princes Road surgery and staff patients in its entirety, leaving the Princes Road buildings redundant. Buildings have been vacant since 2018, and whilst change of use has been sought, um, it has been proved to be vulnerable. Many may be aware that squatters broke in last autumn and have caused a significant amount of nuisance locally and have costs uh, and only recently been evicted. Historical correspondence between the, the surgery and the NHS Trust justifying their decision for the change of use has been part of the planning application. Dr. Sharma was left um, with a site which no longer was able to use as a surgery nor given in the type of accommodation a converted Edwardian house easily suit any other community type uses. And it should be noted that the Council's policy DC, DMC1 does allow for a change of use of surgeries if there is no loss, and in this case facilities have been located elsewhere. The situation is not uncommon, and it should be noted that the Council had approved a very similar change of use from a doctor's surgery to residential at Cannon Lane in Rains Park in 2015. Given that the building is located with predominantly residential area, change of use to residential is in any case seems to be the most appropriate and sympathetic use of the site. Historically, in 2014, an application was made to, to um, convert the imp partly implemented um, surgery extension, uh, which was refused. Uh, subsequently, as group architects were engaged to review the situation and put forward new proposals effectively looking at, uh, for a trade-off, providing a reduced and more sympathetic development over that approved surgery design and allow the change of use to a sustainable residential development. The current application represents a design that is a result of a negotiation with planning officers and proposes a sympathetic approach that reflects the architecture of the Edwardian terraced houses and the surrounding roads and significantly reduces the volume of the building over that which has got currently planning permission. To put it in context, the scheme is 370 square metres. The original was 541, some 30% smaller. Um, I'll just briefly touch on some of the comments that have been refused as uh, um, part of the uh, consultation. Parking. Um, the proposal is fully compliant with the local authority's requirement for parking on site and to avoid any further parking stress on the surrounding roads, the applicant is willing to sign a Section 106 agreement to limit the use of park, uh, parking permits. I'm going to have to stop you there. Thank Please. you. Um, any comments on that? No? Shall I just... Yeah, okay. Um, Councillor Holmes, please. 
Um, Chair, thank you very much, and, and thank you very much for calling this item. Um, I'm, I, I would just like to begin by commenting on the fact that I've been involved in this site as a councillor for a number of years now, uh, and a number of applications have been before this committee. And I have to say, Chair, it's not my understanding at all uh, that the applicant was in a position where she had to close her business or it had to be relocated. Um, and having been uh, involved in this site as a councillor for a number of years, I would just like to point out to committee members that that is not my understanding of what's happened. Um, in terms of this particular proposal, um, as, we've, as, 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 as the report makes clear, there were two previous grounds for refusal, two out of four, that don't appear to have been addressed. So additional parking pressure was raised before as an issue. Uh, to move from five spaces to four spaces appears to me to exacerbate that issue. Um, if, the, if that matter has not been addressed from the previous refusal, uh, then I would urge committee members to consider very carefully this evening whether it can now be accepted. Um, the application was also turned down before because uh, there had been a failure to demonstrate that there was no alternative viable community use, um, and I see no progress on that matter either. It has been a community asset. <clears throat> there was very strong disappointment and feeling, as members of this committee may recall, um, in the community that the doctor's surgery was being closed, um, and, and I think a review of alternative uses would be important, and this was a reason for its refusal before, and I don't see anything uh, that has suggested that that's been um, addressed. So two of the four principal reasons for the refusal before, in my mind, haven't been addressed, um, and therefore I, I would urge committee members to consider that very carefully. We've heard already, so I won't go into the detail, we've heard already the problems with the extent um, and a previous officer, uh, uh, sorry, a planning officer um, actually described the previous application as being an unneighbourly form of development, which would be detrimental. I won't read the whole thing, but it, was in, it goes on to talk about visual intrusion and overlooking. Um, and this application does not address that. In fact, um, in fact the uh, resident, my uh, constituent who lives next to this property, um, she argues that it would be worse. Um, she also argues that the, uh, the, the, the images that would have allowed uh, us or committee members to see that uh, were available last application and not this application. So the argument um, uh, is that it's actually worse. And, and uh, we've also heard this evening about the significant extension to the width of the property. Um, I would ask committee members whether 17 people living in this size of property uh, is going to work. Um, there are internal kitchens that have no windows, which isn't good practice. The building line has been broken, as we've heard, and I don't think the precedent is helpful. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, so with regard to the um, doctor's surgery um, closing, we have um, submitted the application, these um, emails and letters, and also a report um, from the Equality Commission explaining how the existing um, existing building is not really fit for purpose. Um, in terms of parking pressure, that reason for refusing the previous scheme was in regard to lack of a sign section 106 agreement at the time of making the decision. Um, and so with that being provided now, should permission be granted, then that, would, um, that overcomes that, that reason for refusal. In terms of our viable community use, so... Under DMC1, um, yes, that is the second part of, of the policy. Um, with this application, the applicant submitted a, um, um, a letter from a chartered surveyor who's gone to look at the building, um, provided their professional opinion on it in terms of looking at the use and also considering whether it would be suitable for other D1 uses. Um, we have also had um, letters put forward by third parties suggesting that a nursery could occupy the site, up to 45 children. Um, however, the site is small, it's on a junction, um, any outdoor space would be very limited for a nursery and building requires significant investment. Um, so whilst that is a, um, we have to take into account the balance of considerations with the scheme, a number of benefits to, this, to the area really, um, if you look at the, the scheme itself, it's now in traditional form, also with soft landscaping to the front, so there's in and around there's a number of benefits to the scheme which we now consider um, make it a good scheme and acceptable to grant permission. 
Thank you, Chair. Questions? Councillor Lanning. Thank you, Chair. Um, just on the DMC1 point and um, the evidence from the Chartered Surveyor, so on page 243, it highlights the, the poor lay layout of the building and it would require a high cost to bring the building up to modern standards. Would that not also be the case to bring it up to modern standards for sort of residential use as well? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, because um, he's looking at the a D1 use and also the existing doctor surgery use. So he didn't comment on suitability as existing residential use, I'm afraid. Councillor Are there rooms like kitchens that don't have any uh, natural light or windows? Um, sure, so the kitchens are, so ground floor, Oh, yeah. So ground floor, they are open plan kitchens, so they have windows serving from the from the outdoor space here. Um, they're set quite far back in the within the flat, but that is that's quite standard. Um, the kitchen over here has two roof lights above it, and also it's in open plan. First floor level is the same, similar layout to to the ground floor, and top floor does have roof lights, and it, again it's open plan as well. So there is um, there is no kitchens isolated. Any other questions? Comments? I think it actually, uh, from, from the CGI, that integrates quite well with the existing streetscape. I mean, my only um, slight reservation is that flank wall facing onto Trinity Road, which is a bit... Um, a bit stark. I don't think those are grounds for, for turning it down. I, and given the offer of um, making it permit free, which deals with one of the two points and the other, um, about alternative community uses, I think the, the, the evidence is that there has been a, a sufficient process to explore those. The surgery is reprovided in the uh, Patrick Doody Clinic. So, um, on balance, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to support it. Okay, if there are no more comments, we'll move to the vote then. Can I see those in favour of the application, please? Six, seven. Those against, and not voting. Council McGrath isn't voting. <laughs> Sorry, I'll just remind. Recommendation is um, approved. We now move to agenda item six, which is Blenheim, six Blenheim Road. Chair, um, if I can just draw members' attention to the drawings that you'll see um, on the, uh, the screen uh, this evening. Um, there were two sets of uh, drawings, uh, one set submitted at the end of October, one submitted about a fortnight later in November. Um, I believe you may have been circulated with the um, October drawings. Uh, they should have been the November drawings, but they've all been uploaded um, and they should be on the presentation um, on... Uh, Yes, yes, we, we, we've got all the, uh, uh, the amended drawings um, uh, here. Um, so uh, the proposal is to um, remodel um, and extend this locally listed building 
uh, in Rains Park uh, to uh, increase from uh, three flats uh, to um, eight flats. Uh, we have um, proposals to remodel um, the uh, addition at the side um, here. If we look at the back of the site again, you can see a rather, rather tired um, building. With a, so there's a proposal to come out further um, at the back um, uh, here. The proposals also include uh, a basement, although none of that will be um, immediately perceptible from uh, the street scene. Uh, the proposals have been subject to negotiation, and if I can draw members' attention to page 22 um, of the officer's report, you'll see that the scheme started off uh, as a scheme for 10 uh, units. This has now been reduced to six, sorry, to, uh, to eight uh, flats, so uh, uh, a 20% reduction in the numbers of, uh, uh, of units. Um, officers acknowledge there have been a number of objections. Uh, there are concerns about overdevelopment, uh, the proposals being out of keeping, uh, concerns as well about um, uh, traffic and uh, vehicle uh, congestion. Uh, there are a number of key considerations um, pertaining to this proposal. Um, the principal one um, relates to uh, the effective use um, of uh, the site, um, and this is supported as it makes better use of what is um, actually um, quite a large um, uh, suburban plot. In terms of the Council's own planning policies, um, it also meets one of our key criteria insofar as it reprovides uh, family sized um, units, and there are two family sized units uh, within this um, scheme. The officer's report um, takes you through the various planning considerations, um, including at paragraph 7 uh, 11 uh, in the officer's uh, report on page 26 um, design. Um, the proposals have been um, well considered. Uh, the proposals um, uh, retain the asymmetrical appearance um, of the property. Uh, proposals had originally um, looked at something which tried to reinstate a, or tried to instate a degree of symmetry uh, to this property, but uh, it's one of a number of locally listed buildings, um, uh, all of which have quite distinct um, uh, asymmetrical um, designs uh, to them, so it was felt that uh, that was um, out of keeping. Um, the proposals in terms of their impact on uh, the street scene have been um, modelled quite effectively um, by some uh, computer-generated images um, showing the refurbishment um, of uh, the building um, at the front um, and at the rear. In terms um, of uh, impacts on neighbouring properties, they're all uh, considered from paragraph 7.2. Um, looking at um, planning standards such as amenity space and floor space, um, these standards are, um, are all met. If I can draw your attention to the um, drawings on the screen, you'll see that um, the proposal uh, provides for five parking spaces. I believe the drawings that were circulated to you showed six parking spaces. The reduction of one parking space enables um, more landscaping to be provided in front um, of uh, the bay um, uh, on the Blenheim uh, Road uh, elevation, which is considered to be positive. And this is um, factored um, against the um, known um, car uh, ownership levels uh, in the borough, which I think um, I've highlighted before as being around 69%. This would provide um, a parking ratio of around 62.5% um, in terms of parking spaces for the numbers of flats uh, which are proposed. The um, uh, issue of trees um, is carefully considered, and although a tree um, appears to have been removed from uh, the front of the site, this wasn't afforded any formal protection um, uh, prior to the scheme coming forward, and to the rear of the site where there are trees, these can be reasonably protected by way of attaching uh, conditions. Uh, the amendments did include um, creating uh, additional basement um, space, um, but officers have considered this um, along with um, uh, the council structural engineer. And again, uh, the basement aspects of the scheme have been properly assessed um, and are uh, proposed to be conditioned um, in the event of planning permission being granted. And the scheme is recommended for approval. Thank you.
Um, Terry, no, uh, sorry, Jilly Lewis Lavender. Can I just point out before my time starts, it's actually number eight, Blenheim Road. I think you said six. Yeah. So, <laughs> small point, but I thought you might like to know. Okay. So, uh, the architect has done very well in producing an attractive design for this much-loved house, and especially since he has taken heed of local residents' feelings and paid attention to preserving some of the building's historical features. The newly designed building will fit in beautifully with the rest of our road, with the exception of two points. Number one, the basement. The owner may not realise that this part of Rains Park is on a floodplain, and there is an underground river running the length of Blenheim Road. <coughs> there are several ancient oak trees that have preservation orders on them in the road. Our insurers have recommended that we should produce a document showing the current condition of our property that we will copy to the developer, so that if the digging of the basement affects the foundations of our house, he will honour any damage caused by the excavations. I would like confirmation of this, please. We, we would also like to know that the developer will pay due care and attention to this, the access to this property whilst being built, and I hope they will consult residents on this. Secondly, I and many of my residents remain concerned about the parking in this tiny cul-de-sac. I understand that the planning department would not allow a parking bay in the grounds to be allocated to each flat. The owner was willing to make provision for this. Of course, this will not stop the tenants from buying cars and from parking on Blenheim Road, which will increase the um, problems that we are already having. I understand that each planning application is taken as a separate entity, which is ridiculous. All serious revision of planning law needs to take place on all planning applications and the effect on the infrastructure, which has already been mentioned earlier tonight. For example, there will be extra cars from number eight, there will be cars from four new houses and at least 10 flats in Grand Drive, plus a possibility of nine storey blocks in Wimbledon Chase and of course 457, perhaps yes and perhaps no, we have to see how that one goes, flats in Burlington Road. Um, there could be a, perhaps another 600 cars in our local area. The, the roads will not take it and it's uh, complete madness and should not be allowed. Please act sensibly and do your best for Merton taxpayers, not lying in the pockets of over-ambitious property developers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Good evening, and I too would like to start off by acknowledging the changes made by the developer in their redesign of the development and also the number of conditions placed on the development by the planning officer, which address most of my concerns. However, I would still raise a disappointment that the conversion of a heritage asset former home into a block of eight flats will undermine the family-friendly nature of the street. That aside, I have two remaining concerns with the approval. Firstly, I'm amazed that the approval can be given with such a large number of detailed documents outstanding. The conditions request at least a further eight documents to be provided covering such things as the demolition and construction method statement and the uh, basement construction method statement. I hope the local neighbours impacted by this development will at least be granted access to these additional reports via the planning portal in order that we will be able to monitor compliance and be able to share with our insurers should any uh, issues such as subsidence associated with the basement uh, occur. Secondly, in the absence of any detailed method statements, I'd just like to draw the committee's attention to the fact that the property covers access to the far ends of two closes, Blenheim Road and Blenheim Close. Access to the properties beyond 8 Blenheim may be severely impacted during the construction phase. I just request a condition, if possible, of a designated period during the day when deliveries or pickups may take place in order that residents don't get trapped on their own street. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John Bishop. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, conscious of time, I'm only intending on providing a very brief overview of our scheme. We've worked extensively with officers over the course of the last year, and in doing so, we've produced a scheme which has the full support of the planning officer and the council's conservation officer also. As noted, the building is locally listed. The reason for this is the appearance of the building from the street and its ornate 
architectural detailing. So although the building is on the local list, it has been poorly and unsy unsympathetically converted in the past, and it's been uh, extended to the point where a number of these original features, which is the reason why it's on the local list, have been lost or are in a very poor state of repair. So what we have done, we've taken the opportunity in extending the building and converting it to form modern fit-for-purpose accommodation. And in doing so, we have repaired and reinstated the original features. So for example, the ornate plasterwork to the frontage will be restored. The original brickwork will be exposed and repaired. The chimney is repaired and retained. And the ornate timber entrance porch, which is lost, will also be provided. And the rather ugly 1970s crazy paving and, and concrete wall will be removed and replaced with a period style brick wall with railings, which is much more in keeping with Blenheim Road. In terms of parking, we recognise that this is a contentious if issue. It was raised when we had our public exhibition at the site. However, we have undertaken two parking surveys and the advice that we received from the planning and the highways officers was that five spaces was deemed to be acceptable, taking into account the findings of our surveys, the characteristics of the local area and the council's policies. We have included a small basement to the rear. It serves two of the units which will be split level. Also at the request of officers, we have prepared a full basement construction method statement. This has been reviewed by the council's engineer and they have confirmed that the basement element can be safely constructed without causing harm to the road or the neighbour to the side. Finally, it is a large site and it does benefit from a particularly big large garden. This provides excellent opportunity to further landscape the scheme. We are happy to include mature planting to the rear and the front and this will further enhance the quality of the scheme. So in summary, what we're seeking to do is really bring the building back to its former glory and make best use of an existing building in a sustainable location. Thank you. Anything to comment on? Um, just to, sorry. Yeah. Chair, if, if I can just respond to um, uh, uh, the residents' some comments about um, uh, uh, construction uh, activity. Um, impact on the rest of the um, uh, uh, the street, um, that there were concerns about um, digging out the basement. But you'll see there's a very detailed um, condition that's been uh, attached at condition 14 on page 36. Um, and then a further detailed scheme about drainage on page 37. Um, officers have um, you know, had due regard to um, these um, um, issues and feel that the conditions are sufficiently robust and have been used in similar formats um, on other schemes which the Council has uh, approved in recent years. Um, in terms of access during the construction work, again, can I draw members' attention to Condition 8, uh, which is a, a detailed requirement regarding um, uh, construction and demolition um, uh, aspects of the um, uh, scheme and also condition 11 which um, limits the times when demolition and construction work um, can take place. So, so far as is reasonable um, the planning officers have taken heed of the potential impacts of a scheme like this um, on a residential side uh, road and have attached uh, the conditions accordingly. In terms of car parking at the front of the site, this has been a suggestion made to um, the, uh, the applicant um, that um, it would be preferable to see some further landscaping introduced at the front of the site, so not being reckless in completely removing the car parking, we felt that the removal of one parking space could just soften the scheme somewhat uh, without having an undue impact on curbside parking. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Councilling? Um, it says here there's amenity space for some of the apartments, but looking at the illustrations, it's not like there's just one piece of garden. So how's that going to work? Chair, the layout is such um, that um, you can get um, from the interior um, of 
the property out through the back door and then into uh, the shared garden area. So a number of the units have um, little sunken terraces which can be reasonably screened so that um, they maintain a degree of, of privacy. Um, there's a little um, open space at the side of the site for one of the, the units and then we've got this large area at the back which like I said if you follow the hand on the screen you can see there's a route through the building which enables those from upper floors to walk through the building out through the back door and um, into uh, uh, the garden so, so that's what I don't understand am I misreading this it looks like some place have no amenity space but it sounds like the garden is shared by all yes that's correct other questions Councillor. Thank you, Chair. In terms of the existing three flats, how many bedrooms are there per those sort of three flats? Chair, the, um, uh, the scheme uh, has one flat which isn't to be changed. So if you look at um, uh, this, um, we've got um, one unit which is, which is unaltered. Um, as part of um, the, the proposals. So I'm, I'm not entirely um, sure as to what the exact mix is inside the existing um, building, but certainly um, it's, it's currently three flats. One of them remains unchanged, and the proposals provide two three-bedroomed, family-sized um, flats. So my question was... Essentially, are we losing one family-sized unit? So the existing three flats, could they be three three-bedroom units and we're going down to two three-bedroom units? If I can just scroll back to the here we go. So, so here we have the um, uh, the existing um, plans, and we've got um, flat one. So one, two, three bedrooms. Uh, flat three. One, two, three bedrooms, top floor flat, two bedrooms. So we've got two three bedroom units at the moment, but pretty generous three bedroom units. And we're going to have, sorry, and we're going to have uh, two three bedroom units, more compact, but nevertheless meeting national standards. Can I ask on this sheet where it's got um, flat two and flat four at 40 metres square? Chair, for um, the smallest um, units, the minimum requirement is 39 square metres if it's um, got um, a, se a separate um, um, living room and bedroom and 37 square metres if it's got a combined living a sleeping uh, space um, with a shower room. So again, um, the units do appear to, um, uh, to meet the national standards. Are there any other questions? Councillor Nidhu. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on the parking uh, spaces, two questions. Is there provision for disabled parking? Uh, and secondly, how will the five parking spaces be allocated to the apartments? Chair, um, the, uh, the plans would um, enable a fractionally wider space to be provided in the event that uh, a disabled uh, person was resident um, in uh, the development so you can see where the hand is moving by taking out um, that bit of uh, space where the car uh, uh, parking space was shown on the previous 
drawings, it does build in that degree of flexibility um, to uh, the scheme. In terms of the allocation um, of uh, the spaces, well, that would be a matter between whoever's selling or letting the units and uh, the occupiers. There may be a premium, uh, some form of charge for having a space to go with a flat. Councillor Handing. Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of the character of the rest of the street, are the neighbouring properties flatted developments as well, or are they generally sort of large houses? Chair, the, um, uh, the officer's report simply refers to the character of the neighbouring uh, buildings. When I visited the site, um, I wasn't conscious of the neighbouring properties um, being um, split um, into flats. But if you give me a moment, I can check the notifications of neighbours and that should reveal whether or not there were multiple addresses at um, number six, if, if you want me to do that. As far as we're aware, certainly number six next door is for a single family, and number four, the other side of that, was for flats. Um, but I think that owner's going to be selling anyway, and I think that's going to be returned to a single, single family. And number two is definitely um, single occupants, a single for one family. And I don't know. In general, it's mostly. Not about 80% um, family homes and not flats. Are there any other questions? Councillor? It's just, uh, I mean, I applaud the uh, recommendation that one of the proposed parking spaces should in fact be used to improve the landscaping, so there are five parking spaces now, but that leaves at least three um, of the occupants of the or three of the flats potentially looking for spaces on the street. So for the record, this is, it's not in a CPZ and it's not really a candidate for a CPZ, is it? It's, uh, it's not got the parking pressures that, that would... Uh, Um, Chair, having visited the site um, now in connection with this application um, and um, other inquiries that we're fielding at the moment in the, uh, in the area, um, what struck me was um, the availability of parking space along um, Blenheim Crescent, which is uh, the road that you can see to the side um, of uh, the site. It's a reasonably well-dimensioned uh, road, no, no obvious signs of pinch points that would preclude vehicles from moving uh, along there um, and being alongside the uh, the boundary fence the parking of vehicles I don't think it's going to be such a disturbance for for existing residents um, any comments councillor Dean it's a very good wide-angled photograph that if you look at the size of the car it is quite a narrow road but say la vie um, I, th I think it's very good. I don't think anyone's critical of the development. Um, I just think that it's one of those things which is the developer's been very clever here because it's slightly too much, but he knows that uh, a lot of um, councils will say, well, we really shouldn't stop it. Um, so if people feel that way, then it's going to go through. If people feel that maybe there should be seven flats and maybe a couple of them shouldn't be 40 square metres, then I'd support rejection, but I think it's nearly there. Any other comments? Councillor Southgate. To comment on, on the, the quality of the proposed um, redesign, which I know you can do a lot with CGI, but really is, is, uh, is very attractive and very, very well done, actually. Okay, going to move to the vote. Can I see those in favour, please, show? Those against, not voting, three. And the recommendations carried. Uh, we now move to Seven Rural Way.
Tobin Byers has circulated uh, some information on this application. Chair, um, if I can um, just um, flag up uh, uh, an amendment which officers are proposing um, on the um, recommendation. It's, it's a minor adjustment. Uh, we're recommending that the scheme be um, subject to um, uh, being um, permit uh, free, um, but we also acknowledge that this will entail um, some adjustments on the street to the existing traffic management orders, including um, uh, where parking bays are designated and where yellow lines um, are um, set out. And it's important that um, all the council's costs are covered um, in the event uh, that planning permission is granted for the scheme. Um, the proposals um, would replace uh, an existing bungalow um, in the street um, with um, three uh, houses. If you look at the planning history um, in the report, uh, you'll see that there was a proposal um, uh, recently to um, demolish um, two uh, consecutive um, uh, bungalows. So the bungalow um, where the hand uh, is moving and the next bungalow um, here uh, to provide um, six houses. Um, and it may seem odd that um, having refused um, the previous um, scheme that um, a, a site which is now seemingly half the plot, officers are now recommending uh, approval. Um, but um, I would suggest, and this is not um, absolutely accurate in terms of proportions, but it's not so much half the site as perhaps more like five-eighths um, of uh, the site. So there are subtle differences in terms of the geometry of this site uh, with um, the larger plot on which the previous refusal um, rested. The three houses um, which are proposed as part of um, this um, scheme would be um, 16 metres wide, whereas the refused scheme uh, was a scheme uh, which was only 14 metres wide. And you'll see from the report that one of the observations that we made was that the proposals would result in a, a rather cramped, um, busy rhythm um, of housing, which somewhat departed from uh, the character of the rest of the street. But the subtle differences translate into, for example, here where we've got a um, four-pane window, another four-pane window next to it, two four-pane windows and two four-pane windows again. The previous iteration of this, as I said, not only two metres um, uh, uh, narrower, um, the um, uh, roof details uh, were much more akin to uh, a full um, uh, gable-ended roof, and rather than having these double-paned um, windows um, here and here and here, um, they were only single um, uh, panes um, wide. So again, just giving that feeling of something that had been squeezed in um, more. In terms of the back of the, uh, the site, um, the changes translate into um, a scheme which rather than having gardens which were slightly below standard, um, in terms um, of um, uh, uh, hitting the 50 square metre uh, target. We've now got a scheme that just about meets um, that um, target. One of the gardens is um, slightly above, but um, for each dwelling, they all meet the council's um, adopted um, uh, standards. Uh, the scheme you'll see from the report is up to standard in other respects, um, such as um, floor space and room uh, sizes. It makes effective use um, of uh, the site, so replacing one of, I believe, in 19... I think the survey was done in 2004 by John Fordham Associates. It was some preliminary work um, on uh, a borough character study, which may have fed into the local development framework. There were around 600 bungalows 
uh, across uh, Merton. So removing one bungalow and putting three family houses um, in its place. So again, fulfilling the objectives which the government is driving um, uh, planning authorities uh, towards making uh, more effective use um, of uh, sites. Um, and the scheme is recommended for approval, subject to the completion of a Section 106 agreement to make the scheme permit-free, covering those traffic management order changes um, and conditions. Thank you. David Darling. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say thank you to the committee for allowing me three minutes. Uh, I am almost literally a NIMBY, being as I am backing on to the development. Uh, Casting an eye earlier today at the guidelines on what it can say on the matter, however, it makes you think that maybe three minutes is a bit on the long side. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one important reason for me being here tonight is to actually see those who are proposing the development and allow them to perform the consultation amongst interested parties, uh, something they have not done so far, uh, not on one occasion, but on two entirely separate occasions. We have had no consultation whatsoever. I should also point out that you saw in the photograph that we do have a perfectly good property already on site, albeit a bungalow, and yes, it is a little <laughs> neglected. What we have near was a previous plan for three narrow overlooking dwellings on two plots, replaced by a plan for three narrow overlooking dwellings on one plot just as intensive per plot. A significant concern for the plans is our loss of privacy, uh, with three tall houses now overlooking ours, especially as the plans show no evidence of keeping the retaining the mature trees. Another concern is the possibility of flooding. Rural Way has flooded two to three times in our memory. We know that the Gravney River has a floodplain already and currently comes to the bottom of our garden. The increase in the hard standing coupled with the removal of the trees I doubt would contribute to uh, mitigating this. We feel by all means build a new house if you really need to. Don't squeeze as much as you can into a small site build a decent house with space for the occupants to live and breathe. Gravely District has already had too many large-scale developments. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I live right next door in Fiverr Way in a semi-detached bungalow. I've lived on the road for 16 years. As you can imagine, I've seen a number of changes. At 8 and 10, at least one of those was a bungalow. That has been since redeveloped, and that is a two-house, two uh, townhouse. The uh, number 10 is also a town, two townhouses. It is not three. We, my concern is that once that you will set a precedent, that you will uh, con to continue every time a bungalow comes up for sale, let it be redeveloped for three townhouses. We see this as overdevelopment. As I say, it will set a precedent. It's not in keeping. Also, I am next door. I think it will overshadow me. It will affect my privacy. Um, I have on Rustic Avenue already uh, houses to our, that are three, two or three floors. I'm already very overlooked. I just think this this um, is not in keeping with with the road. It's a small cul-de-sac as well. We will lose car parking spaces. And whilst you may not see this as an issue, as residents we do. And if we lose parking spaces, where are our plumbers, electricians, visit, you know our shopping deliveries supposed to go. You know, um, if you continue in, the ve in this vein and let this agree to this uh, application, we believe that it is overdevelopment, that the street will not be able to cope with the overdevelopment. 
and it is likely that in uh, those three houses that we will have families and upward of 15 people. The road just isn't going to be able to cope. Thank you. Um, Kathleen Lug, please. Um, the Council has covered much of the general points of the proposal already and has gone some way to set out the design justifications, so I'll try not to repeat the points he's covered, um, but I feel it's important to highlight the following points, most of which respond to the objections raised. There's been a suggestion that the scheme is similar to the previously refused scheme. However, I would point out that this scheme was initially recommended for approval before a last-minute change in decision. Given that many of the aspects of the scheme were complemented and supported, namely the principle of a two-storey development on the site, the general site layout and design of the individual houses, so yes, we did retain some aspects of the previous proposal. Indeed, the revised proposal is a result of the advice and discussions through the course of this previous application. However, while there is a degree of similarity between the two schemes, I would point out the new proposal is half the size of the previous scheme which was for two terraces, over the two, two terraces, three houses each, over the two plots. We also adapted the design to introduce elements which mirrored the surrounding properties and created a more articulated front elevation. It is also worth pointing out, as already has been done so, that the plot chosen for the development was the larger of the two previously combined plots, which allowed a more generous garden spaces and a greater separation between the existing buildings to each side. The new development complies with all the required separation distances and therefore no issues of, in terms of overlooking. Indeed, many of the design decisions in terms of the design aim to minimise the impact on the amenity of the surrounding properties. It's true that the, propo the proposal sits between two single-storey properties, we, but we have reduced the bulk into the building by introducing a hip roof which enables the two-storey proposal to relate to these neighbouring bungalows. There are only small dormers to the rear and the eaves level has been kept low as possible while still allowing a modest bedroom within the loft space. This ensures that the building retains a two-storey appearance and is on comparative scale to the other terraces and majority of properties along the road. There has indeed already been a precedent set by the approval at number 21 railway, which was for a similar scheme to replace an existing bungalow with a terrace of three houses. The existing rear garden of the property is neglected and overgrown, mainly with bushes, none of which are deemed to be of any planning significance. And the proposed scheme will have ample planting along the boundaries, the details of which will be conditioned as part of any approval. In addition, there were comments raised about the extent of hard, hard standing. However, the proposal actually seeks to increase the quality of the landscaping to the front, where currently there is merely a driveway, extensive paving, and some overgrowth to the boundaries. Which brings me to the suggestion that the proposal will, un will increase the flood risk. The applicant had to undertake a detailed flood risk assessment as part of the application, which has been assessed and found to be satisfactory. And indeed, there will be little change, little difference in the footprint and hard standing of the proposal compared to the existing property. This is due to the large footprint of the bungalow, garage, and outbuildings and the hard standing to the front. Any comments? Yes, sorry, if I can just come back on some of the points about um, separation um, and loss of privacy. Um, the officer's report highlights that there's a separation distance um, of 22 metres from uh, the um, uh, first floor uh, and above windows uh, in the direction of Rustic um, uh, Avenue. Um, so if you think normally we'd be looking at um, meeting a separation distance of around 20 um, metres, um, so 22 um, would comfortably um, meet um, requirements that we might previously have relied on. Um, in terms of impact um, from construction, um, I fully respect um, that the demolition of, uh, of, of a bungalow and the erection of three houses um, can be the source um, of um, uh, uh, nuisance um, and inconvenience uh, to existing uh, residents. You'll see from the officer's report that a demolition and construction method statement um, is to be um, or is, is required as part of um, uh, any approval 
Um, but if members are minded to approve and it's felt that there should be additional controls um, such as um, uh, uh, hours uh, of construction and deliveries to uh, the site, then that could be um, included. Um, yeah. Um, can I just say, Councillor uh, Byers has um, produced um, uh, his objection to the scheme. Have you all got a copy? And have you read it? Because I don't want to read it out, but we've all seen that. Do we have questions, please? No questions. Do we have comments? Yeah. It, um, yes, it, it, it's it's a comment, really. I, I notice that the the frontage for the three houses amounts to fifteen point eight meters. So that's a little over five meters a piece for the frontage. And I'm just trying to gauge whether that's going to look. A little bit pinched, and um, you know, it, the, the sum of this really is: would two houses fit better on on this plot than than three? But I welcome comment. Are there any other comments? Questions? Sorry. Thank you, Chair. I think that three three bedroom properties in the middle of a site that has two one-storey bungalows either side. It isn't sort of respecting the rhythm, the scale and the spacing of the surrounding area. And I appreciate that we have to look at each application in isolation, but I do think that this might set a precedent, seeing as the previous application was for the two sites for six properties across them. So I, I would be minded to, to refuse this. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> having looking at the present um, um, outlay of the houses and then um, the new plan, I think it would be um, a good precedent for the street itself and uplift the area. So I think um, it it's something that I would say, you know, definitely I would approve of. Councillor Jeep. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, my thoughts are that really it, it, it shouts out as overdevelopment, bulk of mass. It should be two, not three. Uh, so I would be minded to propose a motion that we, we reject it on bulk and mass. Um, does anyone else have any comments? Before we find out whether it's a seconder. No? Okay. Do we have a seconder for that? We do. Okay, then I will put that to the vote then. Um, should we refuse on bulk and mass overdevelopment? Those in favour? Six. Six, those against? Three, the recommendation is successful and the application is refused. <laughs> Two. Uh, agenda item 10. Yes. Okay. Um, Councillor Ward has, was not feeling very well, which is why he's not here. So, uh, members, so the oh, sorry.
think we're going to have to move on. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, members, the application site is at 29 Merton Hall Road. Um, the site comprises a um, mid-terrace dwelling on the east side of Merton Hall Road. The application itself is for a variation of condition to a previous planning permission, which relates to the conversion of the existing ground floor flat to create one one-bed flat and one studio flat, including a rear extension. The variation condition proposes changes um, to the rear extension, which are listed in the three bullet points on page 206. Um, one of the re main reasons for the application was there was some discrepancy as to the on the previous permission in terms of the ground level um, measurement to the height of the extension. Um, so if I can explain the previous application drawings, it had the ground level as just below where the doors are. However, um, following the implementation of that permission, um, uh, the architect acknowledged the mistake made, and now the application is shown is to regularise this. So the result of that is that the eaves height of the lean-to extension at the back is 500 mm taller than was sh um, shown under the previous permission. The depth of the extension is the same. Uh, one other change is here. There's a little infill to create a bit more space for the shower room here. And the roof tiles are changed to slate roof tiles. Some site photographs from the case officer. Um, as I said, construction underway. Um, this is the at the rear. Um, looking to the left-hand side, neighbor, the other neighbour has a similar lean-to extension. And to the other side is a conservatory extension. Uh, so overall, Chair, um, officers are satisfied with the information provided and recommend permission be granted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've um, agreed to read out the following statement um, that would have been made by Councillor Fairclough on behalf of Keith and Lorraine Marys of 27 Merton Hall. This application doesn't comply with planning requirements because it fails to produce essential information mandated by Merton's planning application validation checklist. The planning officer's report contains material errors, serious difficulties with design and construction are not addressed. These issues include, one, the property is not two-storey, it is three-storey with a cellar which is not mentioned at all. Two, the application claims to clarify the change in level between the new flats and the garden, but this is not the problem. The construction difficulties are due to the differences in internal floor levels within the two flats. Because no cross-sectional drawings have been provided, the planning officer cannot determine this. Three, the applicant says it's important to understand that the extension itself has not changed in height. Yet the report states there is a proposed change in height, which is confusing but the previous planning permission limits the height of the extension to 2.8 metres to comply with planning rule DMD2. So this cannot be changed. There are no details of the extensive work carried out to date, including demolition of several internal walls, not annotated on the earlier application, nor mentioned on this one, and the destruction of many of the original Victorian features in the property. The elevations lack detail, and do not show the recently built extension which departs significantly from the first planning permission. The extension compromises the structural integrity of the building and the adjacent houses. The layout of the flats is very inefficient. The first one bed flat is below the minimum permitted size for two people, yet over 25% of the floor space is a lobby and corridors. The planning officer's report says the proposed works are minor and inconsequentially changed to the already approved works. However, the errors and omissions suggest major changes are involved, making it impossible to determine whether the application adheres to planning rules. Further details and fuller explanations to be found in our submitted comments document. If, a mandatory, if it is mandatory that detailed and accurate information is provided, therefore this application should be rejected as invalid. That's their comments. We do not have an agent here, I think, to speak. No? Is that Ben Jones of Ben Jones Architects? No? And do you want to comment on any of them? Comments? Uh, have you received that? Yes, sure, I have. Yeah, I've got that here. So, um, have you 
have you incorporated any of that in your presentation? Uh, some of it. The um, I think just to clarify the height, the height situation. So the the extension is higher than was shown on the previous permission because the ground level was shown incorrectly. So um, we have assessed that and assessed the impact. Um, as you'll see, it is only 700 mil beyond the rear building line of the neighbouring property. Um, the eaves height is 500 mil higher than was shown previously. Um, we do have a section plan showing the extension coming out and, and um, steps allowing to step down to the garden. So that is reflective of what is currently being built now. So the application obviously seeks to, to regularise this and we're satisfied we have enough detail to make a decision. Thank you. Are there any questions, please? No questions? Any comments? Yeah. Uh, so I, I was hoping the applicant would be here because um, if he's the freeholder, um, the building is a dog's dinner and it's an absolute mess uh, from top to bottom. And I was hoping he was here just to embarrass him into actually doing something about it. Uh, I, I don't think we should stop this because it's already been ruined as a, a property and I, I don't think there's any problems with this. Any more comments? Move to the vote. Those in favour of the application, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those against? And two not voting. <laughs> well, you can't vote because you weren't in. Okay. Then the uh, application is agreed. We now move on to agenda item 11, which is land adjacent to 2 Park Avenue, Mitchell. Chair, if I can uh, draw members' attention to the modification sheet, uh, there's a little bit of tidying up of text um, in part of the, uh, uh, the officer's report just to um, uh, improve um, some of the clarity. Um, this uh, proposal is for the redevelopment um, of a former scaffolder's yard uh, to provide five dwellings, and you can see the yard um, in the photograph um, before you. You can also see um, to the left uh, at the image, um, a, a number of, um, uh, I'm thinking early um, uh, 20th century, late 19th century um, shop and um, uh, residential units fronting onto Streatham Road beyond. And then, if we've got the photograph here, um, these are the backs of a number of um, quite unusual uh, little um, uh, garages and, uh, and workshops. Uh, at the back of the um, uh, uh, the shopping um, uh, parade, uh, but you can see the um, uh, the former yard um, in the uh, uh, the picture here. Um, if I can take you back to the um, uh, photograph, sorry, the um, images um, of um, uh, this scheme, um, we have what I would um, describe as um, a bespoke solution for uh, an irregular um, shaped um, site. Um, the um, proposals um, follow pre-application discussions with um, uh, the designers um, and uh, the scheme was um, tabled for consideration uh, to the design review panel um, where, as you'll see from the, uh, the officer's report, um, it did uh, receive um, a, a very um, positive um, hearing. Um, there were some concerns raised by um, members um, of uh, the panel, um, but officers would suggest that they um, related mainly to internal arrangements within the scheme and that those issues have been um, ironed out now. If I can just run through the various principles um, relating to this particular um, scheme, um, the loss of the employment site, the scaffolders' yard, um, you'll see from uh, the report there's detailed consideration um, uh, of that 
regarding um, the uh, previous um, use. You'll see the company went into um, liquidation um, and uh, it appears um, there was little um, or no opportunity to make a, a profit, profit um, hence voluntary liquidation. Uh, the premises was vacated the same year. Um, it's been um, uh, vacant since um, 2017. Um, there's been growing concerns regarding fly tipping um, and um, its general appearance has a negative um, impact on the year, uh, on the um, area. Um, the irregular shaped um, uh, site um, doesn't really make it uh, particularly attractive to um, uh, uh, modern um, uh, startup um, businesses. And um, in fairness um, to uh, uh, the applicant, if we actually consider the wider context and look at the um, shop units um, fronting uh, Streatham Road, there are a number of vacancies there and officers would be more inclined to try and direct um, start-up businesses and B1 uses to those shops um, rather than uh, a site um, in a side road um, such as this. Um, you'll be aware that the prior approval process enables changes of use from vacant shop units to residential and officers have only recently refused a prior approval submission for the conversion of the end unit there to provide um, a, a residential unit because it, it was felt very much this was something that really could set everything going like a, uh, um, uh, a pack of dominoes um, and would really undermine the attractiveness um, of this parade. So we've focused on uh, this particular um, site. The proposals um, would increase the provision of uh, housing, so that's positive. Um, if you look through the officer's report, um, the officer has considered carefully the character and appearance of the area, um, the um, uh, very, um, well, I would suggest high quality uh, design approach that's been taken uh, to this particular um, scheme. So that's something that, uh, that we're supportive um, of. In terms of neighbour impact, uh, again, this is carefully considered. Um, and it's felt that it wouldn't have a, a harmful impact on uh, neighbours. Um, the accommodation um, meets uh, adopted standards. Um, and again, um, in terms of one of the other key considerations, that of, uh, of parking, um, we're advised by the transport officers that because of pressure locally on um, uh, about the issue of car parking, um, it's um, imminent that a CPZ will be introduced in the area and that therefore um, means there's an opportunity to make this scheme permit free. So this scheme is recommended for approval subject to a section 106 agreement and, uh, and conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Ralph Strumpfer, please. Yes, hello, I'm Ralph. Um, I live uh, with my wife and uh, two kids on one A Caitness Road, a uh, uh, property uh, adjacent uh, to the northern side of the new development. In general, we um, appreciate that the site is uh, being redeveloped because at the moment it's uh, really ugly, uh, but we have some uh, major concerns about the proposed plan. There are three key points I want to highlight. First of all, the unacceptable, unacceptable high density of the development. The proposed development will have three three buildings comprising of five flats with nine ba bedrooms in total. This is a much higher density than any other properties in the area of similar size. The road consists of terraced, ho terraced housing with sing single family houses uh, or two flats in, in, in a house, uh, but three blocks with five flats seems uh, an, an unacceptable density. It doesn't fit uh, to the local identity and, uh, and, and, and character, doesn't allow for much garden space, and I doubt this meets the minimum space uh, requirements for quality living. Two buildings seem okay for me, but three buildings in that small space uh, seem just unacceptable. Number two, the in invasion of privacy and loss of outlook uh, to, to our property. The, the proposed development and the last uh, building, Unit 5, I think it is, uh, is planned to come right uh, to the boundary of our, our prep property, which is much closer than any other properties in the area. The distance between the rear of our house um, and, and the garden fence, which is also the boundary of uh, the development, is seven meters, and the distance uh, in the plans um, of, uh, uh, of, that, uh, um, uh, of the boundary, the garden fence, and unit five is two meters. So that would mean a total of nine meters uh, between the rear of our building and the rear of, uh, of, of, of unit five. 
On page 223, it states there's a, a distance of 14.7 meters, which is clearly wrong. I went, went outside yesterday into my garden, measured that again. It's maximum 9 meters, not 14.7 meters. Uh, so we believe that uh, this doesn't meet the requirements uh, for enough space between buildings, and there's also a gross in, in invasion of our privacy. Also considering that the bedrooms and uh, windows are quite close, we have a climbing frame in our garden. So on the top of the climbing frame, my son would look exactly into the the bedroom of, uh, of, of Unit 5, so I don't think that's uh, nice for my son or, or for the, for, uh, for the uh, occupants of, 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 uh, of Unit 5. Um, there will also be a loss of light and overshadowing into our garden, and specific in, in, in winter when the sun is very low. Um, and number three is just a uh, potential damage to our property caused by the building work uh, due to the close proximity of the proposed development. It is highly that, uh, that the, you know the building work uh, uh, will cause damage to our our our, our, our garden. There's also a nice uh, uh, bush uh, between the two properties, so will it be maintained? So we just want to make sure what uh, uh, measures are being uh, put in place to protect our, our property. Um. Alan Gunn. Hi, my name is Benedict Looney. I'm the architect of the project. Um, do we have, and I'm with Alan's colleague, Jeremy, here. Do we have six minutes to respond to the comments? Three, okay. Well, briefly, we really enjoyed working on this project from the outset. Think it's a really amazing site, like your neighborhood, and um, really enjoyed researching it. Arts and early 20th century architecture um, are the buildings that we've come up with aren't looking particularly like Victorian buildings, but they're surely inspired by Victorian architecture using bricks and tiles and patterned, patterned elevations. We've tried to, we, it's an interesting group of streets, the avenues. We're thinking that Park Avenue is a bit unloved, and so we thought to do something kind of interesting and, and cheerful there. Um, and very much taking a lot of architectural cues from the neighborhood, the, the shopping parade with its polychrome elevations, the arts and crafts churches there and about. Um, it's had a long journey. We've been working with Merton productively for two years on this, and it's been a really interesting journey. The first scheme was definitely too dense, with six units. We tried to shoehorn a little terrace into that rather awkward wedge-shaped site, but after the, um, that didn't go well with the first visit to the design review panel, we reworked the scheme. Made, we've made piles of sketches along the way, cardboard models, computer models, lots of hand drawings. And the, the, what seemed to unlock the scheme was um, to make these three pavilions and have them oriented in different ways, meeting the um, different conditions. I take the um, objector's point about density and proximity to his garden. We've tried to mitigate that by having a little bike store at the end, so the thing that kind of meets the, the adjacent folk to Gaithness Road is a low-key, low, key, low low um, bike, bike store. And the one thing that we really took on from the design review panel was the idea of having it look inward, not look outward. It's frosted glass on your side, on, on the north and on the, on the west, east sides. And so it's now kind of inward looking with, towards a birch tree and a bench and some and landscape features. Jeremy, do you have anything to add? Thank you. Um as, as stated earlier, this has gone through a long gestation period with detailed pre-application with, with the council, uh, the design review panel. Um, we, we've assessed the representations from the neighbours. Um, obviously, parking can be controlled via parking permits. Um, there are no policy objections in relation to amenity space, neighbouring amenity or housing provision. Um, construction disturbance is not a material consideration, can be con controlled by condition, and no technical objections have been raised by any consultees. Thank you. Thank you. I have to stop you there. No questions? Yeah. Could the control parking zone go in with making it um, 
free for these uh, for the residents of these properties, given that these properties aren't built yet and the CPZ hasn't been consulted on in some ways. Yeah, Chair, um, the CPZ is, uh, is going to happen because it's, it's in on program to impl implement and this the occupants are, will not be liable for a permit within the CPZ zone when the, implement, when the CPZ is in place. So what big it's all too Right, that was the question. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Any comments? Councillor Southgate. I'm just, you know, the, the no permit condition, to be honest, seems harsh in a, a PTR rating of two. And before the CPZ is implemented, you can't really know the, the, the scale of demand, can you, for, for permits? Uh, Chair, the, the, the residents do need, a, they had a petition to, that's the reason that the council was having a consultation and before the implementation of a CPZ zone. In this case, um, it's going to happen. So it, it, although it's a PTL is low, the, the occupants are, will not be liable for a permit. It's in my ward. <laughs> The, uh, the CPZ is going ahead. Um, the parking is pretty dire, but the entire ward will be a controlled parking zone and it will be problematic. It will be problematic. If people ha own a vehicle, there will be absolutely nowhere for them to park because the whole ward is a controlled parking zone. Um, I just would like to say I was at the design and review panel. I'm not allowed to speak at the design and review panel. I just have to chair it like Najib does. And I was very impressed um, by the presentation um, that you, you produced for that particular committee. And I know you've tweaked things since then. Um, but I did, yeah, it was quite impressive, I think, the way that you um, uh, took on board, I think, the views that people um, were expressing. Um, and it was, good to, it was good to be at that meeting. Um, and you've got a green light. <laughs> it's always interesting to, because Najeeb and I never have, can take part in these things, but it's really interesting when they get, get a green, you have to work to get a green light on, on the DRP. I would, I would think there would be a problem with the parking. I do really, in terms of issuing non-permit, not uh, issuing permits. Given that the entire ward is a controlled parking zone, if anyone has a vehicle, I have no clue where they will park. Well, I'm, I'm one person. <laughs> I can put forward a suggestion. But... It was a surprise when Merton Park became extensively CPs added. Uh, the number of cars that disappeared which were occasionally used and people find somewhere they can park them out the way, a second or a third car. So it, it did actually reduce the number who were eligible for a permit quite, quite dramatically. In which case, these people are going to be resident, I, I would, would make a case that they should be allowed to, uh, to apply for permits, actually. It's got a P2 rating, PTAL2 rating. I would say that if you were to walk from um, Caithness or Park through Ashbourne Road, you've got Tooting Station and a load of buses. You've got Tooting Broadway, which is a couple... Of, it, it's not... It's, it, it might be two, but it's actually not that far to walk to, to transport. And there's bus routes in Streatham Road as well. So it's... I... I I would say, as a rating, two is a bit harsh, really. Was... Uh, it's, it's a sustainable location, so it's a, it's a people can travel, walk to the station. Yeah. 
it's not, it's, it's, that's not limited. Uh, and have a yeah. limit on the number of permits they can apply. One per maximum. Um, Some people don't have a car, and I know lots. And uh, we discourage having, having the cars for the new developments. That's the reason that we restrict the permits. There is there any park off street parking? There isn't, is there? No. I I I just feel that if somebody lives in an area which is CPZ they have as much right as the next person to have a permit. And I think they should be given one. Let's, let's vote on whether or not we go with a permit. To include permits in this, we haven't even got to the, <laughs> whether we agree the application. Let's, let's, sorry, can we... Are we in favour of this application? Please show. So, no, those against? Not voting, one. And now the permit situation. Are we agreed that we would limit permits to residents in this development? To one per... What do you mean, as in one permit per house? One per household. Yes. Yeah. Permits are effectively rationed by price, so they become a lot more expensive for second and third cars. and. I, mean, I think it would make sense to, to, to say one per... Uh, Max. Per, yeah, yeah, actually. Get a bike. Yes. <laughs> and a car. Okay. Those in favour of that? Yes. You. Good. 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 Eight. Eight. And um, those against? None. Was it one? <laughs> then um, there we are. So the application is successful and that's the situation on the permits. So now we move on to agenda item five, which is 177 Arthur Road. I'm sorry it's taken so long. <laughs> you can see why though, can't you? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Can members. Can the conversations outside the chamber, please? Hello. Ralph, would you mind? Thank you very much. Uh, members, the application site outlined in red here is um, in Arthur Road. It's known as the Glass House. Um, it is a building um, that is, um, used to, was office, uh, sorry, commercial at ground floor, used to be offices above, now residential. Um, the application itself, that's the existing site plan here. The application itself is for roof extensions to the existing building to provide two flats, uh, one one-bedroom unit and one two-bedroom unit. You note from the planning history, um, there has been two, three previous applications refused and an appeal dismissed. The existing site, uh, it has an undercroft, uh, lower ground floor level parking underneath the building. Um, there is residential properties to the north. So just running through the existing plans. So existing building like this. Um, this is the view from south southern Sorry, Eastern on Arthur Road, looking up Arthur Road. And looking from the north. So the proposal... We are. So the proposed extensions consist of one flat here. This is a close-up of this. Um, so it'll be a one-bedroom unit with a front balcony fronting the residential road to the east. The other flat would be a two-bedroom flat on top of the higher part of the roof. 
uh, where it had outdoor amenity space wrapping round here and then fronting Arthur Road here. That's a roof plan showing where the proposals would be. So the applicants, hopefully you can see it on here, in blue, they have shaded the appeal decision, appeal scheme 2017, and also the refuse scheme in 2018 in green. So that is reflected throughout the elevations. So looking at the proposed Arthur Road elevation, the proposal is the main section you can see here. In green is the most recent previous refusal. And in blue was the appeal scheme in 2017, which was dismissed. So that just helps give you an idea of the changes and the reduction in scale. Viewing up Arthur Road, so the flank elevation of the building. Again, blue outlined there and green. So the previous scheme that was refused under delegated powers stretched across there and down. So that's the one bedroom flat here proposed. Then there's a gap and then a two bedroom flat proposed on top here. And again, looking from the west. And the north elevation, so the one bedroom flat flank elevation here and then behind that, higher up, the two bedroom flat. The applicant submitted some 3D visual aids to assist with the application. So on the left hand side was the dismissed scheme appeal, then the refused scheme recently, and then this current application here. So this is views from the residential row to the east. Site pictures. So the two bedroom flat um, flank elevation be up here. This is looking up Arthur Road. So the other one bedroom flat would utilize this roof space above here. So it will be staggered. So the one bedroom flat and then two bedroom flat up here. Uh, on the residential road to the east, looking up. So here and then there. Uh, both flats are set back from the edge of the building. They're also proposed to utilise existing materials now to match the existing building. So the nearest residential occupier here to the north. And then the other side, so the building has been subject to extensions in the past, which I believe are here on the back of the building here for residential flats, which have been implemented. The building was converted under prior approval to residential use um, a few years back. Looking from the north now down Arthur Road, so the in terms of the flat itself will be back here, it's on that part of the building at the back there. But that's just to assist members this evening. Uh, overall chair, officers are satisfied now that an acceptable scheme has been put forward which visually is acceptable to the local area and has overcome the previous refusals and the appeal decision. And officers therefore recommend permission be granted. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gretton. Are you able to turn to the photographs of the um, Residents Association letter? I don't know if you can do that. I don't, it was distributed, I think, to committee members. Anyway, you may have it in your pack. But will they have that chair? I sent it through. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they on the screen. Not on screen though, but they'll, they'll have that in front. You'll see that um, the photos of the, as, as the building stands today, it's a, it almost looks out of place. It's a large structure um, that sort of towers above the local houses. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the, the new um, construction, whilst it sounds relatively innocuous and it says it's a part third floor and part roof extension on the fourth floor, Actually, when you when you look at it from the Stratford Road entrance, it's exactly the same height, and, and still just as overlooking uh, for all the residents of, of Strathmore Road. And uh, it goes, I think, it, it, it resolves one aspect of the building on the other side, on the far side of Farker Road. But for Strathmore Road, it's exactly the same as as went through the the two or three two of the, the previous three refusals, I believe, before, and uh, it's caused a lot of concern um, to the residents of Strathmore Road. That it still um, you know, should be rejected uh, for exactly the same reasons, which basis of size, height, form, and design, 
and overlooking um, the, the residents there. Um, so we believe the residents believe it's a, and very much so the ward council as well believe it should be a case of simple rejection because it, it still um, overlooks um, the Strathmore Road in exactly the same way as the previous application, um, and it hasn't resolved that at all. And you can see that from I, I think your pack in front of you. If for any reason the panel is minded to consider um, granting the application, then there are three conditions which could be um, put, first of all that all or, um, that could be imposed. First of all, that all the obscured glass um, should all be highly obscured as opposed to partially obscured. Secondly, that the Strathmore Road um, side of the roof extension um, on, on the, for the roof extension and also the third floor should be set back one metre further. Um, so it addresses some of the concerns of the residents um, at the moment to set back a little bit, but a further meter would go a long way to actually um, mitigating some of that. And that the height of the roof extension um, on the fourth floor, this brand new story effectively for this building, it's not just a small extension, it's a brand new story that should reduce if, it, if it's feasible um, in accordance with the planning offices um, considerations by, by 20 centimeters. Those are the three conditions which um, would do some of it, but we think that because it doesn't address the dimension concerns and the height on the Strathmore uh, Road side of the building, then uh, the residents and, and the, the ward councillors feel it should be rejected in the same way as before. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to. Oops. Questions? No questions. Councillor South. So I'd like to hear officers' comments or response to the, the points that Councillor Grattan has made. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, the the previous the the out scheme outlined in blue was a scheme that went to appeal, and the inspector agreed with the council that the that scheme would be overbearing, and um, have a harmful impact not only to the to the neighbours to the north, but also on the character of the area. You'll see it was a very large, stretched rooftop extension. Um, the submission then following that um, proposed to continue that height but across that section of the roof. Um, so again, that was a very large, um, quite a deep flank wall there, which were front Strathmore Road and, um, and the neighbours to the north. Um, so the, some of the key changes really with this is that now it is stepped, the height has been reduced. So you'll see the blue, the blue line, the height's been reduced significantly. Um, to allow for the uh, extension. The, the rooftop top extension has been designed with a lot of glazing to try and make it as lightweight looking as possible. The materials now would match as well. With regards to overlooking, the top floor flat is balcony largely here fronting over the existing roof and then coming around to Arthur Road. It has been set back a metre here from the um, that elevation and screening um, is proposed here on the lower flat, I could, you should, could call it. Um, this flat roof section um, is not to be occupied now and the, the only outdoor space is to the front. So overlooking would be down towards the road, um, towards the road frontage. So in terms of the um, suggested conditions from Councillor Gretton, um, we can't condition to adjust the plans. Um, that could only come forward if members decided um, to, for example, defer the application to, to see if that can be done. Um, in terms of obscure glass, so that, that the obscure glazing condition is, is, is fairly standard, and we, when that comes in, um, we do review it um, to ensure that it will rule strict overlooking um, to the neighbours. So, for example, I believe with this particular flat here. Um, yes, there's some obscure glazing on this side and there'll be a screen here to assist. Thank you. Questions? No questions. Comments? Good Lord, no comments. <laughs> okay, can we move to the vote then? Those in favour, please show. Those against? Not voting. <laughs> um, 
You've got a number missing. Did somebody not vote? Oh, yeah, can't, can't vote, and, yeah. and Dave's, yeah. not, Dave Ward's not here. Okay. So the recommendation is um, agreed. Um, for 579 and 589 Kingston Road. May, may I just say that, I'm sorry I didn't say at the very beginning that I can't vote on this. You can't vote uh, on these, the, the reason okay. I can't is because when the last application came through, yeah. uh, the uh, developer came to a public meeting and I engaged him to discuss the street trees that are going to be put down. And I feel that we had such a conversation that I can't sort of okay. um, go further. But what I would say, the reason I'm saying that, is yeah. that I can't find the street trees in this application because they're not a change for, since the last one. And would I, can I make sure that whatever you pass, those street trees are delivered, even though the officers are not listening, but I know you'll tell them. OK. Uh, street trees, you're off. OK. Oh. So we've got two applications here. Um, we, we don't have any speakers um, for these two applications. Chair, yeah, if I can take you to um, agenda item eight, so that's described as scheme uh, A. Uh, that's for uh, proposals for 118 self-contained um, units um, in a mixed-use uh, development comprising office space um, and flats um, and uh, a servicing um, uh, area and uh, uh, cycle parking. Um, Members may recall um, a year or so ago uh, a scheme coming forward for consideration uh, which was for um, 99 um, flats. Um, at the time that the um, application was being considered by members, the redevelopment of uh, the site of Dundonald Church, which the hand is outlining here, uh, was um, not determined. Uh, this application has now been determined and it's enabled a degree of flexibility to consider how to plug part of the development back into uh, the scheme. Um, and this, uh, along with uh, a reconfiguration um, of uh, the size and mix uh, of units within the development, has resulted in a scheme which in many respects is similar to that if you if you look at the scheme uh, from uh, Kingston Road uh, to the scheme that was approved but as I've said um, it infills some of the space to the rear and in addition uh, does change uh, the mix um, of units. Um, there's quite a detailed summary um, from uh, page 100 and sorry on page 126 uh, summarising uh, the various changes uh, to the scheme and again uh, being a detailed report uh, contains um, uh, assessments in terms of how this scheme uh, uh, varies from uh, the earlier proposals in terms of uh, the housing mix includes commentary from the council's um, housing manager which would appear uh, supportive um, of the change in mix uh, of units. Also provides commentary on the issue of uh, affordable housing. Uh, the previous scheme included 27 units. This scheme following a viability assessment um, would uh, appear not to be uh, viable to deliver uh, uh, affordable um, uh, housing. Um, and the scheme is uh, recommended for uh, approval subject to the completion of a legal agreement which primarily focuses on um, matters around the perimeter um, of the site, sorry, um, including loading, uh, lo provisions of loading bays and reconfiguration of the geometry of the, um, uh, of the public um, footpath uh, around the front 
uh, of the site. And if you look at the modifications sheet, also includes um, uh, requirements to insert what are called clawback clauses within any legal agreement, so that in the event of there being an uplift in value to the site, um, that the council has an opportunity to claw back um, financially uh, a contribution towards affordable housing. Questions? Councillor Russell, make in. Could you explain why there is no affordable housing in this one and there's more properties than the previous one had 99 properties and some affordable housing. This one's got 120 properties and no affordable housing. And the site's the same. Uh, Chair, as um, uh, planning officers, um, we seek to commission um, uh, external consultants to review um, the viability um, figures. Um, costs, values will change um, uh, over time, which can impact um, on the uh, profitability of schemes, um, as can um, interest rates and um, other um, factors relating to um, sourcing materials, um, site clearance, disposal of materials, and so forth. Um, I think you will see from the officer's um, report that um, uh, at 7.4.7, .7, um, it notes, um, therefore, despite officer's reservations over this matter, the scheme has reasonably justified that no affordable housing contribution is viable. So I, I, I don't feel like it, I don't feel in a position at this very moment um, to, to 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 offer any more commentary on that. Councillor Lanning. Thank you, Chair. Um, just two questions: Was the previous scheme that has been approved um, was that build to rent as well? Um, and the second one is just on the recommendation um, and the Section 106 agreement. Does there need to be any reference in there to either the late stage viability or the clawback? Because it doesn't seem to be in there at present. Thank you. Chair, um, my recollection um, of the previous scheme was that the developer was looking at um, a build to rent um, scheme and that provided us with challenges in terms of um, how we were going to manage the delivery of the affordable housing. Um, but nevertheless, that was resolved when, when the Section 106 was, um, uh, was signed off. Um, your other question was about clawback mechanisms and uh, late stage um, viability reviews. And I think you'll find if you look at the modification sheet that we have picked up, well, don't worry, that we, we picked up, we've, we, we've we've omitted that um, in error, and we've now covered um, that. Um, can I just uh, I mean, completely share the, the concerns of other um, uh, members about the affordable housing? But um, can I just point come back to this business about the housing mix? Because I'm a bit confused. On page 147, uh, it says the housing strategy manager has reviewed the housing mix and does not support the mix which reduces the proportion of three bed units across the site. In fact, I think it, it eliminates all the three bed units, um, I think. So I don't quite understand how we go from the housing manager doesn't support that to then r recommending it. Um, yes, the uh, um, uh, the draft, uh, or the, sorry, the, the report b before you um, simply refers at paragraph 7.3.14, um, um, given the move away from a prescribed housing mix, uh, figures in the London plan and arguments put forward by the applicant. It's considered that a failure to provide three bedroom units is sufficiently justified. Any other questions? Comments? Councillor Southgate. There's lots not to like, isn't there? Um, I mean, okay, we, we, we are where we are on, on affordable housing, but there is also the um, TfL's view that this should be permit-free, whereas it's got 
uh, 33 parking spaces. It's Petal rating of four. It's close enough to Rains Park Station that really you know, it should be permit free. Um, the, the point about housing mix has been made also the, the, the loss of all uh, the three bedroom units. Um, and I noticed that on the energy front, um, our climate change officer remarked that it's barely compliant and really would expect to see a much better energy performance than is uh, proposed here. No, nope, I'd like to make some comments. Um, an application was approved last year. We did have a affordable housing so we get an extra eight units on here and we lose the affordable the, the facilities for children's play spaces cut back and um although councillor dean isn't able to speak on this one he would describe it as planning creep i think um there's also mention of the trees that you can't see on the plan which are on here so i'm hoping someone might move a recommendation Ah, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, happy to do that. Um, I, I guess we do... Yes, previously we had affordable housing, so I think we can still cite that. So the, the absence of any affordable housing, given the previous permission, did, in, did include some. Um, lost for children's place space, the... Over, the yes, inappropriate... I'm feeling this is like the things going past in the conveyor belt, and I then have to remember them. <laughs> um, um, yes, the inappropriate housing mix, uh, poor energy performance in particular, um, and generally overdevelopment with the addition of the, the flats now proposed from, from what was... Yeah? If I can just um, clarify on the po point regarding the trees, if a major development like this comes forward and the forecourt is comprehensively remodelled, probably the last thing that will go in will be trees because they'll be the most you know, vulnerable objects as part of the hard and soft landscaping. So whilst I'm not seeking to undermine members' views regarding the perceived shortfalls with the scheme, I would suggest that the point about the trees is straying a bit into an area that I think we could reasonably cover off. Chair, sorry, can I intervene there as well? Regarding the affordable housing, just to make the point again, it's already been made that there is a clawback mechanism within the scheme that's being proposed. Um, it is disappointing that there isn't an affordable contribution within the scheme, but that's, that might not be the case at the end of the day because it is going to be reviewed. If you were to refuse it on the, that particular ground, um, we've had independent assessment supporting um, the proposal that's been put forward. It would be rather difficult for us to defend that at appeal if it came to that. Sorry, yeah. Yes, in, in terms of our policies, it's, it's DM... DMH3, DMH3, so housing mix. Yeah, and overdevelopment would be D DMD2, wouldn't it? Yeah. Sorry, can I just intervene again there in terms of uh, the reason for overdevelopment? Uh, can you maybe explain what that might be? That it expands on the uh, previous proposal by with, with additional applies to both um, applications actually on, on what was originally proposed. So additional units. No, would, so, would that be height bulk? Sorry. <laughs> sorry to sorry to press you on on something like this at five to eleven. 
Um, but obviously um, it, your perception is that there's too much going on the site. But um, in terms of a reason for refusal, what we have to be saying as a planning authority is, and the harm that arises as a result of this is X. So if it's loss of someone's outlook or, I don't know, a, a, a particularly shaded play space, you know, that's one thing. Um, but, pardon me? Uh, well, we, the, I think we, I think the wishes of members are that the issue of the amount of play space available should be cited. Uh, again, um, it is worth bearing in mind that there are measurable criteria in terms of space for individual units. There are there is measurable criteria for communal um, uh, play space. So again, it, it's it's um, uh, you know th th these are matters that that could quite readily be um, uh, latched on were the, were, were the case to go to appeal. May Chair, the the addition of Block D specifically uh, on land previously reserved for children's play space has the effect of reducing. Um, that space, which was to have been 745 square metres in the previously approved scheme, down to 263 square metres. So there is a substantial loss of, uh, of play space for children as a result of the new block being added to the scheme. Can I, can I just explain um, uh, what, what I was saying to, to Neil? Um, when you're calculating shared um, uh, play space, the formula um, uh, works on child yield and a profile of children per household across the whole scheme. For whatever reason, the formula that, that we use in the GLA um, has a higher requirement for play space from uh, households which are affordable housing rather than market housing. Um, if you've got a smaller number of three bedroom family units and you've got no affordable housing as part of the scheme then if you actually run the, um, the little formula uh, for uh, this particular aspect it'll pop out a figure which is different from the one that we arrived at for the 99 unit scheme with the affordable housing and more family sized units. So perversely, although there are more units, when you do the maths, the requirements say you don't need as much space. And uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not you know, saying this just to sort of show, you know, we know about formulas and things, but really it's just to avoid coming up with something for a reason for refusal which really could be hammered by an appellant and you know the last thing that I would want would be the council to be exposed to costs on something like this in that case the you know it, it's uh, obviously been uh, repurposed as a, a child unfriendly development um, and it departs further from our, our preferred housing mix, does it not, by eliminating all the three-bed units? So I, I think that still stands. Yes, I take your point. When you crunch the, the formula, you're going to uh, make the case that the, the play space is not needed because you've made it very unwelcoming for children. Is there also a point around density to the the approved application had a residential density of 458 habitable rooms per hectare. This has gone up to 695, and the London Plan guideline is between 200 and 700. So while it's compliant, it's sort of on the edge. The point around car parking as well, not being compliant with draft London Plan policy, if we can take that. And I don't know whether there's anything we can say about the sort of the cross rail yes. point. Yeah. No, is that a no? <laughs> Um, so the cross rail point was that if 
if this sort of construction is repeated over multiple sites, it will incrementally create barriers to the future delivery of Crossrail 2 project. Is that a bit weak? I think as, as the planning authority, uh, and th th this is where we have um, two things to think about. We have planning policy and the development of policy and making sure that we have a strategic overview on certain land use considerations and then the assessment of a planning application where I'm afraid we've just got to drill down to this specific um, uh, scheme uh, before us. So if Crossrail is cited, it has to be because this site results in some harmful impact on the delivery of, of a project. Um, so, I, you know, I, I know it sounds frustrating, but it, 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 it's, it's very much a case of just, just honing, honing in on, on, on this particular um, uh, scheme. But, I mean, certainly there's, there's, there's material to work with um, here, but if, if members are minded to, to take a view contrary to, to that of the officers. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, there were a couple of points that you raised that seemed to me to be acceptable, but I, I don't know if you're making notes. What, could you just remind me? Because poor, poor Lisa is. Car parking, not controlled. Sustainability, that was poor energy performance. Yeah. Housing mix. The um, TFL recommendation that it should be permit free. John, Jonathan, can you agree? Yeah, that's we. Chair, sorry. Um, from the discussion that's that's been had, it would appear members aren't content with uh, the housing uh, mix and not content with the sustainability um, uh, credentials of the scheme. And in the event that members are minded to refuse, officers would then translate that into a reason for refu or reasons for refusal. Do do we have a seconder for that? Okay, I think we should move to the vote on it then. But so. Um, So those that agree um, with the recommendation, can you please show? To refuse. To refuse, yeah. Six. Those against and not voting. So the application uh, refused permission. We are looking at the second application now. Um, for 579589 Kingston Road. It's not switching off again. What is the matter with it? Um, Chair, um, the um, second uh, application on the site um, described as Scheme B 
uh, would take uh, the scheme up to 124 um, units and you'll see that it's um, buildings of up to um, seven storeys. Uh, again, the officer um, has um, drafted um, a long um, list um, of um, changes uh, which transform the approved scheme into um, this scheme on page 166 um, of uh, the committee uh, agenda. Um, the um, uh, uh, proposals um, include um, additional units um, in the um, uh, the rear block, so that's pro the provision of an additional floor to block C um, to take the same uh, form and layout as that, as the fifth floor permitted under the 2016 uh, permission. So if we sorry yes, yeah, so really in, in the in the centre of the, so we've got additional units here, additional units arriving, sorry, d derived from the reconfiguration of space within the scheme, and then, as with the previous scheme, plugging in uh, that, uh, that corner. So this scheme is the previous scheme plus the units across the top. Um, And I've already commented on the um, uh, the other aspects of the of the scheme. Thank you. Um, can I just ask about the um, the number of stories of the building height? Is it different from last time? I'm completely confused at the moment. Yes, so. Sorry, chair. This is the extra floor, so which is going in in stories. the in the middle of the site at the back of the site next to the railway embankment. Yes, the, this extra floor, does that then take block C up to a height that we previously uh, granted permission for under the uh, application in 2016? Or is it ab above anything previously approved? Well, my, my understanding reading the, reading the, uh, uh, the, the report um, is that we're looking at um, this as being the additional um, uh, uh, bulk. I think amongst the drawings here, we've got uh, that's a very small, sorry, I, I'm terribly sorry, the, the images are, 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 are very small um, here. Yeah, yep. So, like I said, that that that's 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 all um, uh, I can I can say. It's just halfway down that page, one hundred and sixty-six. Um, you know, there there is that that full description. I think the previous scheme had um, blocks that drop down at either end uh, of um, uh, the development. Um, whereas um, this would make uh, a more uniform um, height um, to um, uh, the scheme. Um, but yes, you can see there, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's your, that's your extra bit of... Yeah, it's over and above the previous yeah. scheme. Yeah, that, that, that's the bit we're talking about. So it's about. an extra story. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Chair. I presume the feasibility assessment shows that there's no affordable. Councillor Southgate. So, um, really the only point of difference here is with the additional flats in, in, in Block C. I mean, if, if I may, I would propose we should be refusing on the grounds as with the previous application. And the thing to consider perhaps is whether that additional story and the way it presents a more continuous 
uh, massing effect on the top rather than being broken up uh, also amounts for an additional reason to, to refuse by virtue of, of, um, of, of bulk and massing. Are there any other questions? Com so that was a comment. Any other comments? No other comments. Need a seconder for your recommendation, Councillor Latif. Can we see uh, those in favour of the recommendation, please? To refuse on bulk and mass. As well as, as, well as the conditions on the pre. Uh, uh, so the, yeah. No, Recommendations on the previous application. Yeah. It's a bit late. I'm not well. Yeah. Sorry, Chair. Um, again, I'm sorry to, 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 to ask this of members so late. Um, but in terms of the bulk and massing and the harmful impact on the street scene, views from Langham Court, I, it's got to be something, you know, the, the, um, I don't know, creating a, a sense of enclosure within the development. Uh, you know, all, all, all those, you know, could reasonably be adduced, but I can't say to you, or I can't write a reason for refusal saying bulk and massing, and then make up what I think you th were thinking about in terms of where the harm lay. So that's why I need you to say to me, you know, it's a harmful impact on the sense of enclosure within the development or a... a, a long-range views, something to, sorry to, to. So we, this, again, just to make sure I've got it correct, is that at the back of the, the site overlooking the, or overlooked by the railway, I, I would, I think, argue an impact on the public realm from people uh, going by on the train, actually, <laughs> more than anything. <laughs> Are you happy with that, or would you rather uh, um, uh, talk about a sense of enclosure within the development, or the... Uh, <laughs> well... Um, I have to decide I, that, you're not too honest. Seven-storey buildings in that vicinity. Well, I think Langham Court, I remember citing Langham Court when, when the previous scheme came before committee, um, and the railway embankment and the width of the railway line does create that sense of separation. Um, but um, the railway line, if, you, if, if, you, if you're thinking of that as being something that where people can observe the built form of, 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 of Merton, um, it's, it's, it's a bit un, it's a bit un, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Okay. Well, um, uh, w whether or not it would be all the more visible when seen from. Um, Wyke Road. Um, that, 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 that's something that, that could be um, factored in. And, and again, uh, as I said, perhaps a view might be taken that it, it created a sense of a greater sense of enclosure within within the development. But I can't say that it would. It, it, it's 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 for members to tell me if that's what you believe to be the case. I think we should back it both ways, actually, and say both a greater sense of enclosure within the development, but also an adverse impact on the public realm uh, from, from the railway. I do. Okay. Right, so we've got sustainability. Sorry, mix of mix of dwellings, bulk and massing. Can we vote on those, please? Those in favour of the recommendation to refuse on those grounds, please. Show. And those against. Thank you. So that recommendation is carried and the recommendation to approve is, is turned down. We have 
agenda item 11, I'll find it, 12, is it? I can't find the papers. Okay, so planning, enforce, uh, planning uh, appeals um, is a report to, to note. And planning uh, enforcement, again, a, a report to note. And if you have any queries that you want to raise about planning enforcement in your area, please, can you do that outside of this committee, please? Um, can I thank you for, um, it's a late night session for this particular, but can I thank you for your um, t time tonight? Thank you. We wish you good night.